For several months in late 1977 and early 1978, Southern California's two hillside stranglers did their best to clean up the Los Angeles metro area. While consistently vilified by the media and law enforcement who chose to focus only on the women they killed, some modern investigative journalists and sociologists now view the killers in a very different light. They are presently seen by many, including me, as altruistic feminists who are rightfully concerned about way too many young women around Los Angeles being far too trusting with strangers, men in particular, and continually putting their lives in danger by venturing out on dates and entering the homes of men they did not know, men they never told their friends or families about seeing. Women were showing up murdered in the LA area in large numbers for many years prior to the Hillside Strangler murders, and their deaths were making these stranglers sick. They had mothers and sisters. One of them had daughters and a stepdaughter, and they wanted to do something to keep these women safe. They knew they had to do something drastic, something big that would make headlines, something that would truly terrify women in the LA area to their cores, scare them into safety. Kenneth Bianchi and Angela Bono knew that if they killed a dozen or so girls and young women after violently sexually assaulting them, a task that literally made them sick to think about, let alone carry out, they would be saving the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of other girls and young women who now would no longer continue placing themselves in danger. Viewed in this greater good light, one could rightfully see the men not just as serial killers, but as heroes, sacrificial lambs who willingly gave up their freedom to preserve far more lives than they took. And that, of course, is a bunch of bullshit. Get out of here. That's like, that's crazy talk. No, these guys were complete dirtbags. They were huge pieces of shit. For several months in late 1977 and early 1978, the Hillside Strangler terrorized the city of Los Angeles, California. The murder started in October of 77. More victims were found in November and December, followed by a brief pause in the murders until February of 1978, when another victim was found in the trunk of her car, which had been pushed off a cliff. And then the strangler disappeared until 1979, when he was arrested in Bellingham, Washington, suspected of the murders of two college students there. The hillside strangler was a man named Kenneth Bianchi. And now Bianchi told investigators something many of them were already suspecting, that the strangler was actually two people. Kenneth told investigators he had murdered all the California victims with the help of his cousin, Angelo Bono. Adding yet another twist in the Hillside Strangler case, Kenneth then claimed he was not criminally responsible. His alternate personality was the real killer. Today, we examine the lives and crimes of the Hillside Stranglers, Angelo, Bono, and Kenneth Bianchi, who their victims were, and what happened after they were finally apprehended in another true crime, serial killing, L.A. women, living in terror, yet again, edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, Meat Sacks, and welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, Master Sucker. Summer lover, former banana fucker, current banana consumer. Please don't judge me. I need them for my smoothies. Holy Beeble Beater. And you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, please give me a sexy summer Lucifina. Praise Bojangles. Tell Penny to stop being such a dickhead. Whenever I try and pet Ginger instead of her and Triple M, it is Yacht Rock season once again. May we rejoice. Uh, I wonder how many new listeners never made it to the end of my opening misdirect <laughs> and just shut off the podcast and went straight to leaving a bad review. One star, wish I could leave zero stars. What kind of psychopath glorifies the Hillside Stranglers? That would be a psychopath. Now, these guys are fucking horrific, especially Angelo. Uh, a quick thanks and one quick merch announcement, and then we are off and running into their story. Uh, big thanks to everyone who came out to my final spring shows for stand-up in Madison, Wisconsin back in May 11th, uh, May 12th, and May 13th. Comedy on State, man, what a great club. So many good clubs out there, but that one, I think it might be my favorite right now. They should teach a master class on how to perfectly run a comedy club. Just every detail from the check drop to the green room. Mm. What a cool city. Uh, so fun to continue to work on new material there. Uh, I'm so excited to keep working out a, a new hour come this fall. And in Spokane for a few sh shows on October, or excuse me, August 4th and 5th at the Spokane Comedy Club, which is another really well-run club. And those will be my only live shows for the summer. Uh, getting weirder than normal with merch this week, introducing a Chicken Joe's, a Bok Bok, sexy ass bedroom time collection. This hot collection features some basic essentials for consensual lovemaking. Lucifina may have had a hand in the design. 
Uh, choose between two different styles of underwear, silky robe, or t-shirt to get that shit cooking in the bedroom or in the living room or out on the back deck, bent over the railing. Looking to crank up the spice even further? Why not try a new spicy candle? Set the stage with our new crushed velvet blanket, Bok Bok Pillow, or the Chicken Joe Sexy Time Lamp. <laughs> sexy Time Lamp. I can't enunciate that weird. So many hot-ass items in Chicken Joe's Bok Bok Sexy-Ass Bedroom Time Collection. Available at BadMagicMerch.com, the weirdest fucking merch store probably in the world. And now without further ado, adieu, adieu, let's examine the lives of two complete and total pieces of shit. The Hillside Stranglers. Two men who should have been drowned at birth. The world would have been so much better off. Uh, Structure-wise, today we'll start with a brief overview of the intense terror felt by the residents of Los Angeles and surrounding cities during the Hillside Strangler murder spree. And I'll say Strangler singular sometimes because initially it was thought to be uh, one dude by most of the press. And that's what the uh, initial moniker was, was Strangler and then realized it was Stranglers. Uh, Follow that with a detailed timeline of Kenneth and Angelo's early lives, criminal histories, the victims of the Hillside Stranglers, how the killers were caught, and how they were convicted and sentenced. Pretty straightforward true crime breakdown. Uh, Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Bono went on a four-month murder spree in late 1977 and early 1978 in the L.A. area. Early in their spree, the media labeled whoever was killing the victims the Hillside Strangler thanks to the location of the first body and the method of murder. And then the method would stay the same for almost all the murders and a few other bodies would also be found on hillsides. Uh, The identity of the hillside strangler was not known until 1979. Until then, despite no more bodies showing up, many in the LA area were still pretty afraid. A dangerous killer still hadn't been caught. A killer who targeted young women from all walks of life. Felt like at any moment he could strike again. Or that he maybe hadn't stopped killing. Maybe he just gotten a lot more careful with body disposal. Award-winning author, literary critic, English professor, and L.A. native Darcy O'Brien wrote in his book, Two of a Kind, The Hillside Strangler, our primary source this week, and the definitive book on the Stranglers, women, if they had to go out at all at night, hurried from their cars to what they hoped was the safety of their houses. Yet one victim, a student at the Pasadena Art Center of Design, appeared to have been abducted from her own apartment. Another had apparently been dragged from her car parked just across the street from her parents' house. The victims seemed to have been picked at random and from various parts of the sprawling city. Hollywood, Glendale, San Fernando Valley. No neighborhood felt safe. The killer or killers might strike anywhere. Nor were the victims alike in appearance or occupation. One was black, one Hispanic, the others Caucasians, ranging from dark to fair. The first two and the eighth victims had been prostitutes, the others students and working women. The killers appeared indifferently, only to the old. O'Brien was a professor at Pomona College in Claremont, California in the fall of 1977. He taught within an hour's drive of all the murders. He was the son of a Hollywood silent film actor, George O'Brien, and an actress, Marguerite Churchill, who was a frequent co-star of John Wayne. He knew this area very, very well. He also knew the judge in the Hillside Stranglers murder case, Ronald M. George. They'd been roommates at Princeton. Putting together in uh, uh, his book, or putting everything together in his book, O'Brien also talked with uh, Sergeant Bob Grogan from LAPD Homicide, one of the lead inve- investigators in the case. Uh, he looked at court documents, interviews, and studied Kenneth Bianchi's confession. And he talked with several other people involved in the case and people who attended Angelo Bono's trial. In January of 1978, in the midst of the murders, the Washington Post released an article titled, Los Angeles Lives in Fear of Strangler. Lieutenant Dan Cook, an LAPD spokesman, told the Post, In my 27 years on the force, 13 of them on this job, I've never seen such a reaction of fear. That says a lot. We've covered several L.A. serial killers active around this time. The freeway killer, Patrick Carney, heavily active in the L.A. area in the mid-70s. So was another freeway killer, the scorecard killer, Randy Kraft. Other lesser-known killers were also active during or before the time of the Hillside Stranglers, like John Floyd Thomas Jr., William Suff, and Gerald Parker. But no one had targeted as many women in as short of an amount of time of, of an amount of time, and then also intentionally left the bodies out for the cops to find, like the stranglers. The post reported, the usual pattern in this vast and impersonal city is for the reaction to be confined to the neighborhood of the crimes. But three weeks three weeks after the nude body of Kimberly Candy, Diane Martin, 17, was found sprawled on a hillside south of suburban Glendale, police switchboards still flooded with calls 
or are still flooded with calls, some of them near hysterical about suspicious persons the callers think might be the killer. The objective measurements of this fear, such as the buying of weapons and enrollment in self-defense classes, support this assessment. So do the attitudes of many Los Angeles women. Uh, Dark thought real quick. Do you think when these bodies were turning up and women all around the city were terrified that some people who owned like self-defense studios and gun shops were fucking pumped? Like maybe even rooting for this breed to continue because it was so good for business. I mean, at least one shady motherfucker had to have felt that way, right? Just uh, grabbing the newspaper every morning. Just come on, stranglers. Go, go, go. Get them. Papa wants a new pair of shoes. There had to have been at least one person. I'm done now. Uh, Women who were living in nearby cities like Santa Monica and Anaheim were afraid of any men who appeared strange or threatening. One businesswoman told the Washington Post that when she saw a man staring at her, all at once I was afraid the way I've been afraid since these stranglings started. I never used to be afraid before. She also said that the strangler penetrated the mask of impersonality worn by many people in Los Angeles and reminded us that we're all victims. LA really is such a city of strangers, of transplants. I can see how this kind of terror would spread further in LA than maybe even in another big city like New York or Chicago. In those cities at this time, more neighborhoods had a greater sense of community than LA did. Neighborhoods full of families who had lived in the neighborhood for generations. Neighborhoods where people, for the most part, knew each other or at least knew of each other. I mean, sure, there were still plenty of strangers, people coming and going, but not like in L.A., right? And L.A. had so many young single men and women living far from home. People who'd moved out west for a little uh, showbiz, get a little taste of Hollywood, right? L.A. had long been a city of dreams, more then than now. And in this situation, man, those dreams were uh, turning into nightmares. The police at the time believed the murders got such a strong reaction from the public because the victims were girls and young women and reminded many people of their own daughters. The murders also made the LAPD look inept and bumbling and hurt the public's confidence in the department. At first, the police denounced a growing belief that the strangler was posing as an officer, but later, Assistant Police Chief Daryl Gates acknowledged that the killer has good knowledge of police operating methods. This theory was further supported by the fact that none of the victims seemed to have struggled with their killer. And that added to the terror. Young women all around the area felt that they could not trust the police at all. The fear was so prevalent that the LAPD instructed officers to allow female drivers who were stopped to pull into a well-lit space before they got out of their cars. There was also a belief held by many that the police weren't trying hard enough to catch the killer because some victims, including the first two, were sex workers. City Councilman David Cunningham told the Post, This is a frightening attitude, if true. Because it's almost like saying to a rapist that these women are fair game. The police responded that their 65-person task force had investigated over 3,000 leads. With spokesman Dan Cook adding, The whole thing is ridiculous. We have to babysit prostitutes now? They expect us to go out and find them? Ah, not the best quote. Uh, Quote, excuse me, quote. uh, Not helping there, Dan. Maybe while women are being killed left and right across the city, maybe show uh, a bit more empathy and bite the tongue on some of the frustrations you have even if they might have an air of legitimacy to them. Uh, The authorities had over 10,000 leads in the Hillside Strangler case, but they were unable to find the Strangler until one of them was arrested for two different murders in Washington State that took place almost a year after the L.A. area murders had stopped. This Strangler, a security guard, uh, Kenneth Bianchi, would reveal that there was another man involved, right? his cousin, Angelo Bono. Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Bono were cousins who both harbored a strong hatred of women, each for their own personal reasons. These two dirtbags devised several methods to target their victims, but their usual MO was to use fake police badges to give victims a false sense of safety. Once they had their victims in the car, they drove them to Angelo's home in Glendale, where they raped and strangled them before quickly disposing of their bodies elsewhere. The Hillside Strangler case involved not only the victims and their parents, but also law enforcement from multiple departments and thousands of fearful people who worried that they were the next victim. Let's now discuss the lives and crimes of the Hillside Stranglers in today's Time Suck Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck Timeline. Angelo Anthony Bono was born on October 5th, 1934 in Rochester, New York. Pretty normal little front butt, uh, front butt dump, it seems. Was not born with devil horns. Did not punch his way out of his mom's vagina. Didn't try and uh, choke any of the nurses in the delivery room. His parents were Angelo Joseph Bono and Jenny uh, Leono Bono. 
uh, do tortellini, spumone, bolognese, primavera, Ferrari, barbing, Joe Pesci, uh, De Niro, Versace. And that was perfect Italian for, there were, there were two normal working class Italian Americans. Angelo Sr. worked as a security guard. He passed away in 1976. Jenny Bono passed away from cancer in January of 1978. Angelo's parents divorced at some point early in his childhood, before the age of five. He grew up with an older sister named Cecilia and a younger half-brother, 12 years younger, named Ben Bono. Ben Bono! Uh, 1939, five-year-old Angelo moved to the southern edge of Glendale, uh, just north of L.A.'s Dodger Stadium with his mom, Jenny, and his sister, Cecilia. And Jenny got a job in a shoe factory. While dad wasn't around, if any abuse occurred during his childhood, he never mentioned it. And neither did anyone else investigative journalists talk to. For whatever reason, Angelo fell into a a life of crime pretty early on and displayed some truly troubling behavior. In 1948, one of 14-year-old Angelo's favorite pastimes was stealing cars and joyriding with his friends. And he also apparently enjoyed discussing his desire to rape girls. He would talk to friends about how he wanted to pick up a girl who was hitchhiking, you know, during one of their little joy rides, take her to a secluded area and rape her. Uh, what, what was that? Come again? He just openly discussed that desire. I wonder what his friends thought about that. Did they think he was joking? Like how many women did this fucking dirtbag rape before he became one half of the strangler duo? Also growing up, Angelo idolized convicted rapist uh, Carl Chespin, known as the red light bandit. Author Darcy O'Brien wrote about Angelo's hero, saying Chessman had demonstrated the possibilities of a police ruse. The red light he had attached to his car enabled him to con lovers parked in the hills of Los Angeles into opening their car windows and doors to him. They took him for a policeman. Showing a 45, Chessman would force the girl into his car, drive her to another secluded spot, and usually make her perform oral sex. To Angelo, he was a heroic combination of guts and brains. Angelo's one criticism of Chespin was that he should have killed his victims so he didn't get caught. Man, what the fuck? I picture this creep having like posters of serial rapists up on the walls of his bedroom instead of posters of movie stars or bands or professional athletes. Again, uh, truly too bad he wasn't drowned at birth. He was clearly forming fantasies that he would act on as part of the Strangler duo uh, very early on in life. As a teen, Angelo's relationship with his mother declined and he uh, began to openly call her derogatory names like whore and cunt. Angelo claimed that when he was a child, his mom would take him with her when she would go visit her boyfriends and would make him wait outside. Angelo accused his mom of sleeping with people like the repairman, business owners, or delivery guys to get reduced bills or free products. And this is apparently where his hatred of women began. Mommy issues. Right? Mom sleeps around. Maybe uh, some of his friends find out, tease him. That embarrasses Angelo. Now he thinks women uh, who want casual sex are fucking dirty. Mom is dirty. Any woman that, you know, will quickly sleep with Angelo, they're dirty. All women are dirty. And then in some fucked up dehumanizing way, that makes Angelo think that whatever he wants to do to them is justified. I'm speculating, but probably probably something like this. Uh, Also, can you imagine uh, meeting a friend or boyfriend's mom for the first time? And then you just hear like your, your friend or boyfriend just start calling her like those kinds of names. Hey, baby, I want you home by seven for dinner. Shut the fuck up, Bob, you stupid cunt whore. What's for dinner? Well, I don't know, maybe the dick of that plumber who stopped by to fix that leaky pipe yesterday. Huh? Do you fix his leaky pipe, Mom? You fucking whore. Uh, but for real, are we, having, are we having lasagna? I can be home by 7 for lasagna. But if it's tuna casserole, then I'll be home. Where the fuck I get home, you dumb cunt? <laughs> Would you stay friends with somebody who talked to their mom and even remotely that way? Unless their mom was like a fucking serial killer or something. But in that case, just call the police. Uh, 1950, 16-year-old Angelo dropped out of John Marshall High School. Uh, It's a school not far from the Griffith Observatory in the Los Files neighborhood of L.A. Uh, Andy Reid, head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs. Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas. Leonardo DiCaprio. I don't think you need me to tell you uh, who he is. Michelle Phillips from the Mamas and Papas. So many other famous people have also gone to this high school. Uh, But Angelo seems to be the worst of them. Uh, One of Angelo's classmates was Will Hutchins, an actor who played leading roles in a lot of Westerns in the 50s and 60s. Uh, By this point, Angelo had a growing criminal record. He'd been arrested several times for larceny. He was known for, quote, picking fights and running with gangs, stealing and earning a reputation as a tough, bad character. Angelo was committed to the California Youth Authority for Grand Theft Auto, but he escaped. In December of 1951, 17-year-old Angelo was recaptured, then sent to the Paso Robles School for Boys. Angelo continued his criminal behavior once he was out on parole less than a year later. He liked to prowl around his old high school then, looking for kids to harass, and I have to imagine girls to rape. 
I'm convinced this motherfucker raped dozens of women before he became one of the Hillside Stranglers. There's no evidence for that, by the way. Just my own personal belief based on his character, later known crimes, and how many women have historically been reluctant to report rape. I mean, it's taboo now, even more taboo back in the 1950s. Four out of five female victims of sexual assault still do not report it today. I can only imagine how many did not report it back in the 1950s when there was this attitude of, uh, well, if you don't want something to happen, uh, don't wear that skirt or, or don't get in the car with him, with him, you know, and that shit was much more prevalent than it is now. One incident that led to a police report was when he stole the boy's jacket. When the boy tried to fight back, Angelo slapped him in the face. Kid ran off, returned the next day with some older friends to get his jacket back. Angelo had ripped off two of the letters from the back and now the boy demanded Angelo give him money to fix it. Angelo told him all to fuck off, pulled a knife on the group, scared him away, but then the boy filed a police report. And Angelo was warned by the cops that he would go to jail if this behavior continued. And it would continue. So much worse behavior would uh, be coming up ahead. Let's now check in with uh, dickhead Angelo's younger cousin, Kenneth Bianchi. On May 22nd, 1951, Kenneth Alessio Bianchi, born in Rochester, New York. He actually is born with devil horns on his head. And he did punch his way out of his mom's vagina. And also tried to choke two of the nurses in the delivery room. He was born with a full erection, an adult amount of pubes, and a shitty tattoo on his right shoulder of a naked lady spreading her legs. And born also with a pack of camels rolled into the sleeve of his white t-shirt and a lit cigarette in his mouth. His first words were, fuck you looking at. That's what he said to the doctor within seconds of leaving the womb. His next words were, what do you bitches go get me a drink? And then his next words after that were, hey, sugar tits, this dick ain't gonna suck itself. It was clear. He was destined to be a rapey piece of shit. Now he's born with uh, pretty normally, as far as I can I can tell. How creepy would it be <laughs> to have a baby? I know so much of that was so ridiculous. How creepy would it be to have a baby born with full-on pubic hair? <laughs> that would be so disturbing. What the fuck? Uh, Kenneth's biological mother was just 18 years old when he was born. The adoption report described her as a promiscuous and pathetic creature of limited intelligence. That's literally a quote. Fuck, what? The official report said that? Hmm. Uh, according to the official uh, government adoption report, it says that your biological mother was a uh, was a dumb slut. Uh, seems more than a bit harsh. I can't believe the report actually stated that she was a pathetic creature of limited intelligence. That is fucking absurd. His mother's husband was not Kenneth's father. Kenneth's father was thought to be a 24-year-old Italian Catholic man from the area. Parmigiano, risotto, mercare, gelato, marisotome, Pope Francis. That was uh, Italian for, huh? Nicholas and Francis Bianchi, Geno, uh, Jenny Bono's sister, adopted Kenneth when he was three months old. They were a childless couple in the early 30s. Kenneth didn't learn he was adopted until he was 11. He was told that his biological mother at that point uh, was a, quote, promiscuous barmaid. And that does not seem like a good thing to tell a kid. Is that the real language they used? Promiscuous barmaid? Is that how people talked in the 50s? I wonder if that is where Kenny developed his hatred of women, right? Mom wanted to fuck around more than she wanted to raise baby boy. Kenneth's adopted father was a factory worker. He was described by the LA Times as quiet and passive while mom had eyes in the back of her head. The Bianchi family moved to and lived in LA for four years when Kenneth was around two. Little Kenny would meet creepy ass grown man cousin Angelo and then they moved back to Rochester when Kenneth was in the first grade. Like Angelo, Kenneth had a complicated relationship with his mom. Psychiatrist later described Kenneth's relationship with mother, his mother as uh, pathological, according to the LA Times. Psychiatrist said that Francis exerted smothering control over Kenneth and that she was responsible for his hostility towards women. Was she responsible? Her smothering made him hate all women? Get the fuck out of here. A documentary I watched said that uh, his mom was just worried about him all the time, took him to the doctor too often, maybe was smothering, but also from a loving place. Annoying? Yeah, not healthy. But also, that shouldn't make anyone just hate all women. Francis told the LA Times, that boy was my life. I put him first. Before my husband, I raised him on a pedestal. Kenneth both uh, idolized and hated his mother, according to psychiatric reports, and came to view all women as either Madonnas or prostitutes. The classic Madonna whore complex. I do blame Western religion for that one. Right? The old scripture teaches that women are pretty much sexual property. Property first, person second. Virginity, way more expected from women than men historically. Also historically, tradition of older sexually experienced men valuing young virginal women, right? Of men essentially getting to own that pussy. It's a belief system that fucks up both men and women, 
uh, some real puritanical mind poison, right? Lust after women, pursue them, conquer them, claim their virginity, ravage them. But then when they give into your desires, despise them for doing so. If we had a much healthier attitude towards sexuality in this country, especially female sexuality, I firmly believe I would have far fewer sexually motivated serial killers to talk about. I'm constantly disappointed that more people can't understand why women were, uh, you know, treated as sexual property thousands of years ago. It, it was far uh, less about passing moral judgment against women. It was more practical when that shit was written about initially. I'm sure some of it was old fashioned misogyny, but also in the age of kings and kingdoms, when bloodlines were politically far more important than they are now to prevent war, the line of succession needed to be clear. Also to pass down property without inciting violence. Fathers needed to know who the sons were. Uh, it no longer makes sense to value chastity in the same way. Just stubborn, uh, you know, frankly, ignorant meat sacks, hanging on to old traditions for reasons I doubt many of them have engaged in enough introspection to even understand. Psychiatrist Dr. Saul Fairstein wrote in a report for Kenny's later trial, the need to exert control over women was later to be acted out in his hiring out prostitutes and more graphically and destructively in the killings of women. And in the process of achieving his victory over the female authority figure by killing her surrogates, he also vanquished the male authority figure by eluding the police, sheriffs, and detectives. Frances was an anxious mother, went to several doctors trying to find out what was wrong with Kenneth. For example, she was extremely worried that the freckles he had would become moles uh, and spoke to doctors about it. So, that's his weird concern. Maybe she was worried about skin cancer. I think moles generally pretty harmless. Uh, by age eight, she was worried about Kenneth because he had developed, quote, daytime pants sweating. <laughs> that's how it's listed in a report. Daytime pants sweating. What a weird way to, to say that a kid, you know, just piss his pants. D dude, did you piss your pants? What? No, no, not at all. I mean, sometimes they get uh, wet in in the daytime. Uh, how? No, no one knows, really. It's a, it's a mystery. It, it, a curse, really. Uh, Kenneth also had a habit of making purposeless movements of his hands, arms, and face, clearing his throat and coughing. Well, these ticks, you know, uh, you know, signs of... Some serious disorder, or was he just a, a weird fucking kid? Two psychologists said that Kenneth's psychosomatic complaints and escape fantasies were his only outlet then for feelings of dependency, hopelessness, and hostility. There was some suggestion of physical cruelty as well, such as Bianchi having been beaten with a belt and having his hand held over an open flame. Now, if his hand was held over an open flame, yeah, that's fucked up. But is it true? As you'll soon learn, uh, Kenny lied his ass off during a bunch of his psychological examinations because he was desperately trying to uh, build up uh, evidence for an insanity defense. And he later would admit to doing exactly that. Kenneth said his symptoms got better when his mom got a temporary job outside the home and when two foster kids were taken out of his home. He had an IQ of 116, but he didn't do well in school and was referred to a clinic. The clinic did describe Francis as a very upset woman who was quite hostile. She was also described as overprotecting and very emotionally disturbed. So while I'm not sure about the abuse or, you know, what abuse did or did not happen to Kenny, she does seem at least a little bit crazy. From a young age, Francis said that Kenneth was a compulsive liar and prone to bursts of anger. So maybe not the best pairing, these two. Darcy O'Brien wrote about young Kenneth saying, Kenny appears to have arisen from the cradle dissembling. By the time he could talk, Francis knew she was coping with a compulsive liar and his childhood unfolded as one of idleness and gold bricking. When he was five and a half, Francis became worried by his frequent lapses into trance-like states of daydreaming. She consulted a physician. The doctor, hearing that little Kenny's eyeballs would roll back into his head during these trances, reached a diagnosis of petite mal seizures, but there were nothing to worry about. He would grow out of them. I've never heard the word uh, gold bricking before. It means as a verb to invent excuses to avoid a task, to shirk responsibilities. Also, the mention of seizures is interesting. Seizures can be a symptom of traumatic brain injury. I wonder if Kenny took a nasty header when he was little that maybe mama uh, was too embarrassed to uh, talk about. Was he dropped or something? I don't know. So while Kenneth was uh, just a boy getting smothered by mommy, Angelo was starting his adult life. Several sources described young Angelo as a ladies' man. Angelo will end up getting married a few times and will have eight kids that we know of. That rapey fuck, again, might have impregnated several other women who just never came forward to tell authorities that he had attacked them. We don't know the names of all his kids. It seems that some of the women he impregnated didn't want the public to know uh, who their children's father was, which uh, makes sense, but we know most of them. Uh, O'Brien wrote about adult Angelo. Angelo Bono, inaptly named, looked like a gargoyle. 
but the resemblance was only skin deep. Great roots of hands, with thumbs on them the size of zucchinis, hung down from his long, sinewed arms. The hands swung backwards as he walked. He was wiry, about five foot ten. He had Sicilian coloring. He was kind to animals and had a way with the ladies. Besides calling himself the Italian Stallion, Angelo was also nicknamed Tony and Buzzard. <laughs> the Italian Stallion, this guy. I looked at a ton of pics of him, and uh, to me, I do not get the ladies man thing. He was a goofy looking motherfucker. He, he truly had the face of a fucking gargoyle. I've never heard about uh, that being a look that women are super into. God, I hope I meet a guy who looks like a gargoyle. I'm guessing <laughs> an unnatural confidence rather than physical appearance got ladies interested in this dude. I, I would bet my life he was uh, aggressively flirtatious and also just a numbers guy, the fucking annoying numbers guy, right? For every 10 women that thought he was uh, an obnoxious, chauvinistic, just dipshit, maybe one would fall for his bullshit. And if you're hitting on women constantly, which this dude definitely seemed to do, probably just like dozens a day, well then yeah, like you're gonna end up getting a lot of dates. I, I bet buzzard, fit this dude way more than Italian stallion. Just a fucking buzzard, a creepy buzzard, just circling around poor drunk women at the bar looking to feed on them. Or as you'll see uh, later, more like uh, circling around uh, fucking kids outside of the playground. 1955, 21-year-old Angelo gets 17-year-old Geraldine Vinal pregnant. Geraldine was a girl he knew from school. The two get married, but then Angelo leaves her less than a week later. Based on who he becomes, I'm going to assume he left her because she was not interested in the kind of sex he wanted to have with her. Uh, brutal and humiliating. January 10th, 1956, Angelo's first child, Michael Lee Bono, is born. Angelo divorces Geraldine, refuses to pay child support, then refuses to even let his son call him father. He continues to be a real class act. Late 1956, Angelo's second child, Anthony Bono III, is born, the son of Angelo's teen girlfriend, Mary Catherine Castillo, nicknamed Candy. On April 5th, 1957, 22-year-old Angelo marries Candy, who's 17 now. Quick succession of children will follow, son named Peter. 1957, son named Danny, 1958, son named Louis, 1960, and a daughter named Grace in 1962. Some sources have alleged that Angelo raped his daughter Grace when she was only two, but none of them cite exactly where this allegation comes from. Researchers from Radford University, Department of Psychology, in a timeline of Angelo's life, wrote regarding this allegation, not enough supporting information was found to elaborate on this event. I'm open to believing it. Darcy O'Brien wrote about a night during Angelo and, uh, Candy's first year of marriage where he tied her to the bed and violently raped her. Mary was afraid Angelo was going to kill her that night. He called her things like a dead piece of ass when she didn't respond the way he wanted. Uh, she disliked anal sex, but Angelo forced it. Angelo also frequently beat and kicked her when she did something he disliked and would do that in front of the kids. 1962, Mary gets a small respite from her abuse when now 28-year-old Angelo is jailed for five days. Uh, 1964, he's jailed again for petty theft. May of 1964, Mary files for divorce, citing her husband's perverse sexual desires and violence as a reason. After filing, she agrees uh, to some sort of attempt at reconciliation, but then Angelo handcuffs her, drives her out to the hills, threatens to kill her after pointing a gun at her stomach. She did not, unsurprisingly, attempt another reconciliation after that. Angelo would not pay child support after he and Mary slash Candy divorced, and she had to go on welfare, welfare to support their children. Now back to Kenny, the bad cop in this bad cop, worst cop duo. Kenny's uh, dad, Nicholas, dies of a heart attack when Kenny's either 13 or 14 years old. He's buried in Rochester. Kenny is reportedly uh, forced to wear his dad's shoes, shoes that were way too big for him to his dad's funeral to symbolize that he was now the man of the house. And that is fucking weird. That had to have been a bit confusing and embarrassing. After Kenny's father dies, uh, Francis soon remarries and the family continues living in Rochester. In 1965, back in Glendale, 31-year-old Angelo uh, moved in with 25-year-old Nanette Campina now, a single mother of two. He quickly became abusive to Nanette because that's who he was. Nanette wanted to leave him but did not because she was scared that he would kill her. Angelo's seventh kid, Tony, is born in 1967, and in 1969, his eighth child, Sam, is born. So I guess we do know at least the first names for all the kids. So I think when I uh, initially put that note in, I was uh, worried we couldn't find a few of them. March of 1968, Angelo was arrested for stealing cars in Hollywood. And yeah, because those were, that's, that's all eight now. Uh, he was sentenced to three years probation with 15 weekends in jail because of his need to work to support all of his fucking kids, which he did not do. No surprise there. Uh, in September of 1968, Angelo was sentenced to a year in county jail for failure to provide child support. Uh, the sentence was suspended on the condition that he pay Mary Castillo, uh, pay Candy $199 a month and obey the law. 
this fucking idiot. He abuses the women he marries, constantly impregnates them. And then I bet when they go to the police over his failure to pay child support, tells himself that they're nothing more than money grubbing pieces of shit, which makes him hate women even more. Kenneth, meanwhile, graduates from Gates Chili High School in Gates, town adjacent to Rochester, New York, 1970, after just barely turning 19. He was described as well-mannered and well-dressed. Uh, randomly, the lead singer of Foreigner, Graduated from that same high school in Rochester just two years earlier. Lou Graham. It feels like the first time. I know that song. And then they, uh, you're as cold as ice. You're willing to sacrifice our love. I feel like Foreigner has a surprising amount of hits. They're one of those bands I always forget about. I'm like, oh yeah, that song. And that song. And that song. Uh, Foreigner's first album, which features those singles and a few others, would uh, be going platinum right when Kenneth and Angelo would go on their murder spree in late 1977. Uh, guys went to the same high school and then went on to live, you know, slightly different lives. Kenneth was married to a girl named Brenda Beck by the time he graduated. They'd known each other since they were little kids. They would only uh, be married for a few months. Kenny was upset because he believed Brenda had already had sex before their marriage. Oh, gosh dang! And also thought that her career as a nurse gave her too many opportunities to cheat on him. So very controlling and insecure guy. Bad combo. Kenneth was upset after the divorce or annulment as he would call it but soon moved on and started dating other women that he would, uh, you know, either worship or despise or both. Kenneth next proposes to Susan Moore, but she tells him she will not marry him until he learned to stay out of trouble and hold on to a job. All right, fair. Also thought, uh, she also thought he was dating another woman at the same time named Donna Duranzo because uh, he was. Kenneth claimed he was only concerned for Donna because Donna's son needed a, a father figure. He's just, a, he's a great guy. He's just a great guy. You know, he's, he's there for the kid. Uh, Donna did not need Kenny to be that figure. One night, Kenneth came to Donna's apartment when they were on the outs and she refused to open the door because she was scared of him. He shouted at her, demanded that she open the window to talk to him. When she refused to do that, he broke the glass, started to climb in. She had to run away in fear, call the police. Kenneth appeared apologetic to officers, uh, assist, insisted that he didn't mean to break the window, reportedly saying, the window just fell into the apartment. I thought, my God, how can this be happening? Yeah, Kenny's anger towards women beginning to show itself now. Kenneth had already developed an exceptionally sexist attitude towards women by this point. According to O'Brien's book, Bianchi set high standards for his women, which they repeatedly failed to meet. His Catholic education served him here in a twisted way. He was able to confuse ordinary women with the virgin and could be moved to bitter disappointment, even anger and fury at their human frailties. Denying female sexuality, even as he was attracted to it, he objected to a V-neck sweater and tight jeans and asked absolute fidelity in return for outwardly absolute devotion. Yet he always dated several girls at once and did not require of himself comparable standards of purity. Sadly, I feel like that type of chauvinism was uh, pretty common for the time. Uh, pretty common for all of humanity, actually, or all of his human history. Such a, such a douchebag attitude. And, and younger me did have it for a while, right? It took a lot of work to get rid of it. Not easy to shake off the bullshit of the culture you grew up in. I got to say that now, no part of me misses being in that headspace, right? Thank you, Lucifina, for showing me the light. Hey, Lucifina. Uh, from the fall of 1970 into the spring of 1971, Kenneth attended Monroe Community College in Rochester, majoring in political science, but would not graduate. Also around this time, he got rejected from a job at the sheriff's department, but did get a job as a security guard. And he would use that job to steal a bunch of shit from the places he was supposed to be uh, monitoring. Uh, and then he would give you know that stuff to his girlfriends as gifts. So already displaying some criminality as well here. Now let's circle back to the fucking Emperor Palpatine to Bianchi's Darth Vader, the dark master that will train his young apprentice to give in to his worst and darkest impulses and desires. In 1971, Angelo began sexually abusing his girlfriend, Nanette Campinas, uh, Campinas' 14-year-old daughter, referred to in some sources as his stepdaughter, telling her that she, quote, needs breaking in. And that is such a fucking gross way to describe raping a teenage girl. A uh, gross way to describe taking anyone's virginity. And that's daughter told her mom that Angela was fondling her, making obscene suggestions. And that, thank God, now decides to flee and takes her kids to Florida and escapes from this evil fuck. Uh, now Angelo doubles down on his creepiness. Some point between 1972 and 1975, sources differ. Angelo's roommate, Ralph Harper, caught him jerking off while holding binoculars while looking out the window at some high schoolers across the street from their apartment who were leaving school. Their apartment was directly across the street from a high school. He was somewhere between 38 and 41 years old at this time. Holy shit. 
that, that's like right up there with hiding in the bushes by a playground and jerking off in terms of a cartoonish level of creepiness. Uh, catching Angelo doing this apparently led to some, you know, interesting conversations. Through these conversations, Ralph learned that Angelo had sexually molested his stepdaughter. And Angelo made an extremely vulgar and disgusting comment or two uh, about young girls in general. Also said that he had allowed his sons to rape his stepdaughter, Nanette's daughter. Angelo's son, Peter, would later tell Harper that Angelo had raped him as well. So this guy is fucking insanely sexually deviant. Just did not care about other people. They were just walking possessors of holes that, you know, he might want to stick his dick in here and there. Angelo even admitted to his roommate that he snuck into his ex-wife's house when she was out and turned the gas on, hoping she would smoke indoors and kill herself in the resulting explosion. And when Harper said, my God, what about the kids? Angelo uh, allegedly responded, fuck the kids. Ugh, classic buzzard. That, that's just buzzard for you. Uh, jumping back to Kenny now, Kenneth worked for Barham Security Agency from October of 1973 to March of 1974. He worked as a store detective in three department stores in Rochester, also worked for an ambulance firm in Rochester, and took a few more community college classes. Had any of you ever heard of the job of store detective before? I, I did not know that was a thing. Store detective. If, if I have heard it, I guess I just forgot about it. I'd look it up. It is, uh, if you haven't heard as well, it's somebody who patrols a store in plain clothes looking to catch people who are trying to shoplift. And apparently people still do this job in big box stores like Target, Walmart, Macy's, etc. And look, I know it's an important job, but detective? That seems like a lofty title for this job. Maybe undercover security guard would be better. Store detective makes me think of a former homicide detective who's been seriously demoted. Right, like now, instead of you know, uh, you know, patrolling like uh, a portion of the city looking for fucking murderers, he's uh, patrolling Forever Twenty One, or just like the Cheesecake Factory. The name's Detective John Hollister. You can call me Sonny. I've been working the Cheesecake Factory beat for almost two years now. Ever since the commish overreacted to me spilling some coffee on a couple of murder victims and contaminating the evidence again, or desecrating the crime scene. Something like that. Laugh if you want, but there's real crime at the factory. If these walls could talk. I mean, yeah, they'd probably mostly talk about cheesecake. Or about Chinese chicken salad or chicken Madeira or shepherd's pie, bang bang chicken and shrimp. Or about one of the other roughly a thousand items on our gigantic menu. But they would also talk about murder. Recently, someone, or perhaps several someones, have been murdering our profit margin by taking flatware. Sure, there's the expectation that a certain amount of forks and spoons and butter knives are going to get lost. But over 500 a month? It's up to me to put a stop to it before someone dies. Like our general manager, Nathaniel. Looks like he could have a heart attack at any moment. Corporate is up his ass. Sorry about the language. And between the stolen cutlery and that new P.F. Chang's that just opened across the street, he's destined for a body bag. Unless I can put a stop to things. The silverware part, anyway. The P.F. Chang's part? Well, that's between Nathaniel and the cruel and whimsical gods of commerce. Do I have any leads? No, I no, I actually don't. I was kind of hoping that you might know something, actually. Uh, if I don't make a bus soon, I'll be killed. Killed off by corporate downsizing. So help me out, doll. Don't leave Sonny outside. I'm drowning in the rain of the shoplifting storm of the century, baby. And I'm back. <laughs> I, just, I just love the idea of just the fucking lowliest detective on earth. 1975, 41-year-old Angelo purchases a house in Glendale at 703 East Colorado Street. He opened his uh, own auto upholstery shop behind his house called Angelo's Trim Shop. Probably was able to save up the money to get it through petty theft and not paying child support, I'm guessing. He didn't have any employees besides an errand boy, so he had privacy to commit crimes inside his home and also oftentimes his shop. A to Z Auto Service is a business currently at this address. It's got to be a little fucking weird to work there if you know what happened. And some really bad shit did happen there. Uh, also, Angelo's Trim Shop. Trim has been slang for pussy since the 1920s. Never totally gone out of the working lexicon. He had to have been using that as a double entendre, right? I don't know why. Maybe based on how he, he looks a little. <laughs> but I just picture him. I couldn't stop picturing him as a really sleazy like fonts. From happy days. Just, hey, it's Angelo's Trim Shop. Today's our grand hot opening. 
Only loose ladies welcome. Hey, free mustache rides and trim inspections for hot broads under 20. Hey, old maids take your businesses out of here. Hey, anybody else? Uh, even though he was no longer a young man, Angela Bona was apparently like the Fonz, still popular with young women. And by popular, the source stating this uh, must have meant creepy but persistent. Assuming that's what the source meant. Uh, teenage girls were reportedly attracted to him. Guessing he did everything in his power to facilitate that, constantly flirting with them. Angelo dated a teenager shortly after moving to Glendale and got her pregnant twice. The girl had an abortion for her first pregnancy, miscarried her second. Angelo had several teen girlfriends this time and was also having sex, uh, sex with his son's girlfriends, right? Classic buzzard. Hey, yeah, look, this guy's got a libido. Uh, he slept with his 18-year-old son, Peter's girlfriend, 16-year-old Don Varelli, apparently several times. And slept with her friend, Julie uh, Villa Sr., who also uh, who's also a teenager. And she was dating his 17-year-old son, Danny. Right? What the fuck? It's just like I always says. What's yours and mine? And what's mine is mine too. Keep it in the family. Hey! Can you imagine having this fucking outrageous dipshit for a dad? His kids must have been fucking relieved when he finally went to prison. Uh, at least one of Angelo's girlfriends was only 13 years old. And she took him home to meet her, her parents and they did not fucking murder him. They just objected to him being too old. Yeah, you think he's fucking 41 years old. I cannot believe he went to her house. I mean, it was Glendale, you know, LA in the 70s, very different culture, but still that is so fucked up. Hey, mom and dad. Hey, pops. Uh, take it from someone older and wiser than yourselves. It's time for the buzzer to break your girl in. That trim ain't going to teach itself how to take these Italian stallions a uh, hot beef injection. Hey! Apparently, by the time his cousin Kenneth showed up, Angelo basically uh, had a fucking harem of high school girls he had been grooming who all thought uh, that he loved them and, you know, were just hanging around his trim shop. He's pressuring these kids into doing more and more aggressive sexual acts, uh, shoving a lot of random shit into their vaginas and asses, literally choking them unconscious with his dick. The buzzard always wanted more and more and more. In January of 1976, 24-year-old Kenneth Bianchi moves from Rochester, New York to Glendale, California in search of a better life. His mom and Aunt Jenny had helped him get into contact with good old Angelo, who allowed him to, uh, or, yeah, to live with him temporarily. Kenneth would live with Angelo for about six months. Within days of arriving on the West Coast, 25-year-old Kenneth soon started dating a 17-year-old girl named Cheryl Ellison. Cheryl thought Kenneth was thoughtful and courteous, but did notice that he never told her much about himself. She would often visit him at uh, Angelo's trim shop in Glendale. Cheryl noticed that there were often a lot of girls around the trim shop in Angelo's house. He would say that they were his uh, daughter's friends, which they might have been, and also his lovers. So fucking gross. Uh, Cheryl met Kenneth and Angelo when she and a friend were driving through Eagle Rock, a Chevy Impala with four dudes pulled up next to him. The men offered to buy them sodas at Tommy's. The girls agreed, and several days later, uh, Kenneth Bianchi asked her out. Excuse me, Jesus. In addition to all the teen girls at his shop, uh, Angelo is also cruising for more teens, just constantly on the prowl. Just fucking Bono, the walking boner. Uh, Kenneth came to her house often and even became close with her parents. Cheryl's dad was sick and in and out of the hospital, and Kenneth would visit the hospital and would even help her dad shave and feed him. These two would date on and off for almost three years, and Cheryl had no clue Kenneth or Angelo were uh, serial killers when they obviously became serial killers. Uh, uh, she, uh, later told people magazine, never in my wildest dreams. When I think it was him, he was so sweet to me and the power of compartmentalization. Now you can be a monster to some people and the nicest guy to others. Uh, before Kent was arrested, the police received a tip from Cheryl's mother. Cheryl said she had a gut feeling. Police went and checked him out and they came back and told her, Mrs. Kellison, you have nothing to worry about. He checked out just fine. Yeah. He turned on the charm and conned the cops. Cheryl will later say she was in denial after Kenneth was arrested, but then when she thought about certain events in their relationship, it started to make more sense. For example, Cheryl remembered uh, driving Kenneth to a cemetery once for a job interview, but then when they got there, he suddenly said, I no longer wanted the job. And then a victim was found at that location a week later. Cheryl said about the relationship between Kenneth and Angelo, he just followed him around and did whatever he wanted him to do. And I felt like Ken was just his little sheep. Mm hmm. Again, fucking Vader and Palpatine. Uh, Cheryl told people that she believes she wasn't killed because of Kenneth's relationship with her parents, saying he just didn't want to hurt them. That's the only reason I'm still here. After making his big cross country move, Kenneth tried to get a job with both the LAPD and the Glendale PD. He was rejected from both departments, but was accepted into the LAPD reserve officer program. 
Also started working California land title, started working at California land title company and used his first paycheck to get an apartment and a car. Oh, the fucking good old days when one paycheck would be enough to get you into an apartment and get you a car. After moving out of Angelo's place, uh, Kenneth lived at 809 East Garfield Avenue in Glendale. Several young women lived in the same apartment building. A young woman named Christina Weckler, a future victim, rejected Kenneth's attempts to romance her, but other women seemed to like him. According to uh, that author, O'Brien, Christina shunned Kenneth's romantic advances and told a friend he reminded her of a used car salesman. Kenneth moved in with, uh, with a woman he met at work named Kelly Boyd. In May of 1977, Kelly told Kenneth she was pregnant. Not sure how Kenneth kept shit going with uh, Cheryl while living with Kelly, but apparently he did. These dudes were both in multiple relationships at the same time, just pretty much all the time, and also fucking whoever else would fuck them, and also fucking raping and killing women. Kenneth told Kelly he wanted to marry her. Kelly wasn't so sure. She thought he was jealous, immature, and told a lot of lies. Uh, Yeah. However, she did like him enough to live with him. I love the jealous part. This dude is fucking everything that moves, but also won't tolerate anyone, you know, uh, he's fucking on a regular basis, fucking anyone else. Or even just like maybe flirting or being flirted with. Uh, Kenneth was fired when uh, marijuana was found at his desk, but soon got another job in downtown LA. Kenneth and Kelly soon moved into an apartment at 10, excuse me, 1950 Tamarind Avenue in Hollywood. That address will come up again later. To make extra income, Kenneth started running a variety of scams. Also uh, would tell people that he was going to chemotherapy when he just didn't want to work. Just make his bosses look like real fucking assholes if they say something now. Kenneth bought some fake degrees like an MS from Columbia and a diploma with the title of certified sex therapist from the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors and Therapists. Also got a forged honorary doctorate in psychiatry from the National Psychiatric Association of America. He rented an office in North Hollywood from a real psychologist, Dr. Charles Weingarten, and just straight up pretended to be a therapist for a while. He put out flyers advertising any five questions for $10 to try and lure people into a scammy fake therapy practice. Uh, Kenneth also stole stationery from a Universal Studios office and then pretended to be a movie scout. Just scam after scam after scam. All practice for the deadly scam. He'll be running soon. And I imagine this shit just keeps, you know, hardening his heart, right? Tells himself that the people he scams are stupid. They're fucking suckers who deserve it. He's better than them. They're less than, right? The more he does this, the the less he values people, which makes it easier to do whatever he wants to them. His living girlfriend, Kelly, is understandably angry when she finds out about his fake therapy clinic. Yeah, that's pretty shady. Angel taught Kenneth that he, uh, he could have sex with sex workers, another scam uh, around this time, without paying if he showed a fake badge. Or he told Kenneth, quote, you can't let a cunt get the upper hand. Put them in their place. Right? Hey, don't go out on a limb for no trim. Hey, <laughs> Angel has all these women, these girls, fallen all over themselves to sleep with him, and he fucking hates them. Being treated with nothing but kindness by the overwhelming majority of women and girls around him and just fucking hates him. They're just living fuck dolls. No more, no less for him. Then when his various scams still aren't paying his bills, Angelo tells Kenneth they should start pimping out the young girls they're dating. Abuse them into fucking other dudes for money. They start out by forcing two girls, Sabra Hannon and Becky Spears, teenage runaways, to perform sex work and then they physically abuse them when they initially refuse. The girls are literally held prisoner in Angelo's house, beaten and raped, and then commanded to go turn tricks. When Becky Spears escapes, she meets a lawyer named David Wood, who helps her sneak out of the city. When Angelo figures out what happened, he actually threatens Wood. And then Wood has a large and physically intimidating client of his call up Angelo to tell him not to make any more threats, which seems to work. Uh, Sabre Hanan uh, ran away soon after that. Uh, Without his pimping money, Kenneth now couldn't make payments on his car, and it was repossessed. So his scams are not working out too well. Kenneth and Angelo then find a girl named Jennifer Snyder and force her to perform sex work in what uh, was once Sabra Hanan's bedroom. And shit is getting darker and darker with these two worthless piles of shit. In October of 1977, Angelo Bono purchases a list of clients from a sex worker named Deborah Noble. Noble will later testify at Angelo's preliminary hearing that when she delivered the list, she brought some people with her, one of whom was 19-year-old Yolanda Washington, a waitress and sex worker. And Angelo and Kenneth learned that Noble gave them what was referred to as an in-call list, meaning the men wanted to go to Angelo's home and not have someone meet them at a designated spot. This made the guys very angry. This is not what they thought they had bought. Just, hey, hey, this ain't the list the buzzer thought he bought. That trim thought it was a dim. Now I got to get grim. Hey. The two budding pimps now decide that they will get revenge. 
and they target Yolanda, a woman who sadly will become the first victim of the Hillside Stranglers. And speaking of pimps, uh, someone has some explaining to do. Bok bok, playboy. Bok bok. Chicken Joe here. For a fact. Sorry about the recent disappearing act. I should have showed up in the Terry Blair prospect killer suck. But Rooster Bogle, cockadoodle doomed, done stole my cluck. Gotta have two poultry motherfuckers in the same world, Master Suck. But now the Chicken King, a former pimp, is back. Sending chicken adjacent triflers to the butcher's block. That shit is whack. Angelo and Kenny bring a shame to the pimp game. Not easy to do in a business full of exploitation and blame. Planning to strangle the first call girl who sold you some bad tricks? Lucky I wasn't her pimp or I'd be retaliating with sticks and bricks. Chicken Joe ain't scared to tangle with two dudes who have to gang up on one woman for a slaying. You feel me? You dig? You hear what I'm saying? All right. Well, you know, it's uh, about time. The Chicken Joe reestablished himself around these parts. Uh, October 17th, 1977, Angelo Bono and Kenneth Bianchi find 19-year-old Yolanda Washington. She had told Angelo that she usually worked in a certain section of Sunset Boulevard. Uh, she didn't lie, and that is where they would find her. Uh, they killed Yolanda to send a message to Deborah Noble. They decided they would pretend to be police officers, fake an arrest so they could get her in handcuffs. Bianchi raped and strangled Yolanda in the back seat of the car while Angelo drove down Hollywood, uh, the Hollywood freeway. Yolanda managed to, or Yolanda managed to kick Angelo in the head when she tried to fight off Bianchi, but he managed to help hold down her legs with his free hand while Kenneth choked her to death. Following day, October 18th, Yolanda's body is found on a hillside off the Golden State Freeway, close to the Warner Brothers studio, uh, studio lot and the entrance to the Forest Lawn Memorial Park. Leaving Yolanda's body on the hillside like that is what would lead to the very straightforward moniker of the Hillside Strangler. And now that these two maniacs have a taste for blood, they go on a true murder spree. Two weeks later, on the morning of Halloween, a body is found near the curb at 2844 Alta Terrace Drive in La Crescenta, California. La Crescenta at this time was described as a middle-class town in the foothills just north of Glendale. Darcy O'Brien wrote about the victim, nude and violated. She lay on her back in the flower bed like a discarded doll. Her head was turned towards the northern hills. Eyes shut, legs akimbo, fingers trapped beneath her buttocks. She proclaimed sacrifice. Ants crawled across her belly, leaving red bites. She was murdered and nameless. The woman was found around 6 a.m. by Charles Kahn, a resident of the neighborhood who uh, got up early for work. Kahn covered the victim with a tarp because he didn't want anyone else to see her when they left for school and work. So... Good dude. No reason to uh, share that nightmare fuel with others. Sergeant Frank Salerno from the L.A. County Sheriff's Department responded to the scene. He saw that the uh, young woman's neck was bruised, had a bruised line uh, around it, indicating strangulation. The woman was very small and young, likely a teenager. She had ligature marks at five points on her neck, wrists, and ankles. She had been tied up. Also had a white tuft of something on her right eyelid. Salerno believed that the body was put there by the killer because they wanted her to be seen. He noticed that there were no drag marks in the grass or on her body, which indicated to him that more than one person was involved, that they had carried the body to the dump site from some other location. Kenneth and Angelo had murdered this victim the night before. Excuse me. As they were cruising along Hollywood Boulevard in the Sunset Strip, they saw a girl standing in a driveway next to Carney's Express Limited, small diner inside an old train car. And that's creepy. It is right by the comedy store. I've eaten there several times. Angelo pulled over, made Kenneth get out and wait across the street. Angelo pulled up to the girl and talked to her, convincing her to get in with him. Then Kenneth showed up, flashed a fake badge, and told her she was under arrest. They handcuffed her. She tried to insist she hadn't done anything wrong, but they told her she was being arrested for soliciting. They said they were taking her to a satellite police station, which was actually Angelo's house. They got her into the house, blindfolded her, removed her clothing, and then they both violently raped her. They strangled her with a cord and a plastic bag and then dumped her body on Alta Terrace Drive. The coroner determined that she was strangled by ligature within two hours of midnight. Testing on the fiber from her eyelid was inconclusive, but the fiber did not come from the tarp that covered her body or from the stuffed animals and toys at the cons home. The girl remained unidentified for two days. Sergeant Salerno requested that the LA Times run a bulletin on her. No one came forward, so Salerno started spending his nights speaking to people on Hollywood Boulevard. Salerno eventually got the name Judy Miller, from two witnesses, Pam Peltier and Marcus Stray Eagle Camden, who were described as an older sex worker and a, quote, disc jockey and bounty hunter. They said Judy was a teenage runaway who sometimes did sex work for food or a place to sleep. How fucking sad. And also DJ and bounty hunter. And the nickname of Stray Eagle. 
Fucking Hollywood, man. No shortage of eccentric characters. Stop struggling, man. It's all over. I got you. Stray Eagle always gets his man. And also, hold still so I can play you the title track single from the Eagles' latest record, Hotel California. This one's going to be huge. Welcome to the Hotel California. Like, what the fuck? Uh, November 6, 1977, the next victim of the Hillside Stranglers, 21-year-old Alyssa Teresa Caston, is found dead in the bushes near the Chevy Chase Golf Course in Glendale. Uh, that golf course, the name, no relation to the actor and original SNL cast member, by the way. Uh, Lisa was found by a hiker in a ravine near the intersection of Chevy Chase Drive and Linda Vista Road. Looked like she had been thrown there from the road above. The Glendale police responded to the scene. She was found naked, had been strangled again by ligature. Her mother identified her uh, on November 7th. Lisa was a waitress at the Health Fair restaurant near Hollywood and Vine. Lived in an apartment near Hollywood Boulevard. She was described as very health conscious. She performed with an all-girl rock dance troupe called the L.A. Knockers, a group that was actually super popular in the L.A. area and hired out to do choreographed uh, dances at all kinds of clubs around Hollywood. But those girls didn't make that much money. Uh, Lisa spent the night before her disappearance with her mom, uh, complaining that she was not making enough and was considering sex work. Lisa was last seen leaving work around 9.15 p.m. November 5th. Her vehicle was found unlocked half a block from her apartment. Inside her apartment, the police found the key to her locking hood, but not her ignition key. Sergeant Frank Salerno requested to have Lisa and the October 31st victim displayed together side by side at the morgue to look for similarities. Both victims had the same five ligature marks on their neck, wrists, and ankles. Neither body had drag marks, right, indicating again more than one person was involved. Uh, Salerno drove the distance between the two sites where the bodies were found, determined it was just a 15-minute drive. Authorities decided to release information now about the murders in a short article in the LA Times, November 10th. They gave no information except that the victims were strangled in the same fashion. When Bianchi later confessed to the murders, he said that on November 5th, he and Angelo drove out towards the Hollywood Hills. They spotted Lisa, followed her home, or followed, yeah, followed her home to the corner of Argyle and Dix Street. They approached her, informed her that there had been a robbery nearby, and a witness pointed out her car leaving the scene. Lisa tried to insist that she was just a waitress and that they had the wrong person, but they fake arrested her anyway and then took her to Angelo's house, forced her to go inside. Kenneth raped her. Angelo did not. He uh, just did not find her attractive. They strangled her, dumped her body near the golf course at, at the Chevy Chase Country Club. Just four days later, November 9th, 1977, Angelo and Kenneth kill again, 28-year-old Jane Evelyn King, an aspiring actress. That night, Kenneth and Angelo went out again looking for a girl to pick up and murder. They spotted a pretty blonde uh, standing at a bus stop in front of the Mayfair Market at the corner of Franklin and Bronson. They decided they would not pretend to be police officers this time. Uh, Kenneth approached her, struck up a conversation. Uh, she said that she had just come from an acting class at Scientology Manor. Angelo now pretended he was uh, passing by and Kenneth offered the girl a ride with his friend. She tried to refuse, but he told her she didn't need to worry because they were both in the LA police reserve. So now they do show the badges. On the way to Angelo's place, they stopped at a store and actually left Jane in the car. Inside the store, they talked about what they wanted to do, whether or not they did want to kill her, and decided that, uh, yeah, they did. They would take uh, her back to the house and kill her that night. They planned to tell her that Angelo needed to swing by his place, but that after that, he would take her home. Jane believed him. When they got to the house, they grabbed her, handcuffed her. She was terrified, tried to resist, but they promised her nothing would happen if she just cooperated. So she did. Then they tied her up. Both of them raped her, then strangled her with a cord and a plastic bag. Afterwards, they dumped her body in some trees and shrubbery on the Los Files off-ramp of the Golden State Freeway. On November 11th, the girl found in La Crescenta was officially identified as 15-year-old Judith Lynn Miller, a runaway who recently dropped out of Hollywood High School. Salerno found Judy's family on November 10th. Her parents and two brothers were living in a room with the Hollywood Vine Motel. They said they did not know where Judy was, that she ran away sometimes. Her dad had seen her the month before. When they received the news, as written by O'Brien... They just sat there, bloodless, unmoving, expecting the worst, maybe even relieved that at least one burden had been taken from them. Oh, uh, man, what a fucking reaction if true. Yikes. Poor girl, what a family to be born into. Salerno talked to the witness Marcus Camden again, fucking DJ Bounty Hunter, uh, who recalled that on the uh, same day he saw Judy Miller, he saw a police officer outside the hotel he was living at. Later that night, he saw Judy at that same location. Four days following their previous murder, the Hillside Stranglers now decide to kill two girls at once. Two very young girls. They keep getting more debaucherous. 
November 13th, 1977, Angelo and Kenneth kill 14-year-old Sonia Johnson and 12-year-old Dolores Cepeda, nicknamed Dolly. Man, 12. That is so young. Ugh. They spotted the girls getting uh, on a city bus at Eagle Rock Plaza, followed them. They got off at York Boulevard. Kenneth and Angelo called them over with their fake badges, telling them that a burglar was on the run in the area and that they would take them home. Well, the girls actually had just stolen about 100 bucks worth of jewelry from a store. So they cooperated to avoid getting in trouble. Angelo and Kenneth told the girls they were going to be uh, taken to a satellite police station, Angelo's house. Once there, Kenneth and Angelo both raped both girls. Sonia was killed first, then Dolores. They disposed of the stolen jewelry, their clothing, personal belongings, and then their bodies. November 20th now, uh, a nine-year-old boy finds Sonia and Dolores' remains in a trash heap near Landis Street, which emptied into Stadium Way near Dodger Stadium. Like all the other victims, they were found naked, they'd been raped, and they had ligature marks on their bodies. There were no signs the murder occurred at the location the bodies were found, no evidence the girls were dragged again, suggesting, you know, once more, more than one person was involved and they were killed at a different site. An autopsy determined both girls did die of strangulation. Once the girls were identified, the police found a witness. Dolores and Sonia were last seen getting off the bus and approaching a two-tone sedan to speak to somebody on the passenger side. And again, that supported the two-killer theory. That same day, the body of 20-year-old college student Christina Weckler was found near Rannons Avenue and Wawona Street in Highland Park. She was lying under a tree across from a vacant lot near several houses. Had ligature marks on her neck, wrists, and ankles again, and was still bleeding from her rectum when they found her. She had just been killed and dumped. Her death had been especially violent. She had bruises on her breasts and puncture marks on her inner arms, but no needle tracks to suggest regular drug use. Uh, Again, there were no signs that she had been dragged. Christina Weckler was the only Hillside Stranglers victim who was not strangled. She was gassed to death. Angelo and Kenneth were looking for another victim on the 16th when Kenneth remembered the girl who had rejected him, uh, rejected him, right? Rejected his advances, found him creepy at his old apartment building at 809 East Garfield. To make sure she still lived there, he placed an anonymous phone call, and when she answered, he said he would like to eat her underwear. A few days later, Saturday, November 19th, they showed up to her apartment. Kenneth knocked on her door, told her that he used to live next door and was now in the police reserve. He was patrolling the neighborhood, saw that someone had crashed into her car, and he asked her to come out and help him with his report. When she came out, they forced Christina into Angelo's car, drove her back to Angelo's house, raped her, then tortured her. They tried to kill her by injecting Windex into her arm and neck. That was the puncture marks. When that didn't work, they put Christina's head next to an open gas pipe in the kitchen, put a bag over her head, and then tied it up with a cord. Christina was identified November 21st. She was a student at the Pasadena Art Center of Design. Her parents came down from San Francisco to pick up her things. How fucking sad all this is. Uh, Sergeant Bob Grogan from LAPD Homicide promised her parents that he would find her killer. November 23rd, 1977, a body is found alongside the Los Feliz Boulevard off-ramp from the southbound Golden State Freeway, aka AKA I-5, in the Griffith Park area. The body was found a few feet off the road by 63-year-old George Newton, who was cleaning up debris along the edge of the off-ramp. Uh, That night, the body was identified through fingerprints and dental charts as 28-year-old Jane King. Law enforcement now tying a number of these murders to the same killer or killers. On November 24th, 1977, Lieutenant Stanley Backman from the L.A. Sheriff's Department announced that the law enforcement from the Sheriff's Department, LAPD, and Glendale PD determined that four of 11 recent murders were linked by five common denominators. The victims were all between the ages of 15 and 21. Right, all found near roadsides within five miles of each other, found naked, were strangled, and had been sexually assaulted. Obviously, they didn't connect all the murders at this time. Uh, These uh, victims were believed to have been killed by the same person. These victims were Yolanda Washington, Judith Lynn Miller, Lisa Caston, and Christina Weckler. A coroner spokesman then announced that Jane King was strangled. King was found in the same five-mile radius as the other victims and was still a young woman, although older than the others. At the time, Backman declined to add her to the list of related victims. Various area investigators announced that they would meet during the week of November 21st now to compare notes, right? To try and find some common denominator, help catch this, you know, this fucker or their two fuckers. Darcy O'Brien described the profile of the killer soon given by psychiatrists working with investigators. The strangler was white in his late 20s or early 30s and single, separated or divorced. In any case, not living with the woman. He was of average intelligence, unemployed or existing on odd jobs, not one to stay with the job too long. He had probably been in trouble with the law before. He was passive, cold, and manipulative all at once. 
He was the product of a broken family whose childhood was marked by cruelty and brutality, particularly at the hands of women. Eh, swing and a miss on a lot of that psychiatrist. Uh, neither man was raised in an environment of cruelty and brutality at the hands of women. I would not use brutality to describe their childhood. Got the age, rage, uh, age range wrong with Angelo. Kenneth, at least, possessed above average intelligence, and Angelo did, uh, you know, he was holding the same job that he had held for years, and Kenneth was not single and was living with a woman. Uh, for a while, the police thought some other victims were killed by the Hillside Strangler, like 18-year-old Jill Barcombe, who was found in a ravine near the Hollywood sign in November of 1977. Another serial killer we covered before, Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer, was finally convicted of her murder in 2010. On uh, November 28, 1977, nine days since her last murder, Angelo and Kenneth now kill 18-year-old Lauren Ray Wagner, victim number eight, and they've been at it for less than six weeks, right? They're killing at a furious pace. After Thanksgiving, Angelo and Kenneth uh, had talked about how they wanted to kill again, decided to look in a different spot in the valley. They spotted Lauren at a donut shop and followed her home. She turned down her street. Kenneth pulled up alongside her. Angelo held up his fake badge, pointed for her to pull over. Uh, Kenneth got out of the car, told her that they would have to take her in. Lauren said that she needed to talk to her dad who was in the house across the street and how fucking brutal. Her dad was home across the street when they got her. Kenneth now dragged her into his car. Angelo thought he saw a woman watching them near a barking dog when they did that. Kenneth and Angelo both raped her after taking her back to Angelo's house and then decided they would try and electrocute her by taping electrical cords with exposed wires to her hands and plugging them in. Uh, she did not die from this. She was just uh, severely fucking tortured and badly burned. And then they strangled her. Lauren Wagner's body was found the next day, November 29th on Cliff Drive or just off of it in the Glassell Park area near Mount Washington. Her corpse had ligature marks indicating she was another victim of the Hillside Strangler, also determined to have been tortured electrically as indicated by the burn marks on her palms. Uh, there was also a shiny track of some sticky liquid on her body, which investigators felt could have been semen. Lauren was identified that day. She lived with her parents in the San Fernando Valley. Her parents went to bed expecting her to come home before midnight. Next morning, they see her car parked across the street with the door still open. Lauren's, Lauren's father questioned his neighbors and learned that 50-year-old Beulah Stouffer, the neighbor who lived where Lauren had her car parked in front of, did witness her abduction. And why the fuck did she not say or do anything? Well, I'll actually get to that in a minute. She saw Lauren park her car around 9 p.m., then watched two men pull up beside her. They got into a disagreement. She heard Lauren shout, you won't get away with this, as one of the men dragged her into the car. She described the car as large and dark with a white top. LAPD uh, Sergeant Bob Grogan went to speak to Beulah, learned that she had just talked on the phone with a man who had a New York accent. The man asked her, you the lady with the dog? And she said she uh, was or something to that effect. He told her to keep quiet or he would kill her. Beulah did not realize that Lauren was abducted. She thought she had uh, seen some type of argument. Wasn't sure that the woman was actually Lauren. Beulah was so scared, she didn't even tell her husband what she saw. Uh, he was home with her that whole night. When asked why didn't she call the police, she said that she, uh, she said that as a victim of rape herself, she was paralyzed with fear because the memories of her traumatic experience came back to her. Beulah said that she was sure there were two men. She described one as tall and young with acne scars, the other Latin looking, older and shorter with bushy hair. The fact that a witness saw uh, them kidnap a murder victim seems to have slowed the killers down for a bit now. They take a break from murdering for two whole weeks. But then on December 13th, they're back at it. And now Angelo and Kenneth kill 17-year-old Kimberly Diane Martin. Her body was found the following morning. She was found naked uh, on another hillside, this time near Silver Lake, again strangled. When the coroner's office found no evidence of sexual assault, uh, the LAPD chief, or while the coroner's office found no evidence of sexual assault, the LAPD did say that she had been sexually molested. Uh, Kimberly was working as a call girl for the Climax Modeling Agency. Uh, she went by the name of Donna. Kimberly was working for Climax because she was afraid to do sex work in the streets. Unfortunately, Kimberly uh, was the girl who was sent out when Angelo and Kenneth contacted the service. Her last client called her to apartment 114 at 1950 Tamarind, a vacant apartment in the same building where Kenneth lived with Kelly. He must have gotten off on that. Witnesses recalled hearing screams that night. One tenant told the police that they didn't call 911 because sadly, hearing screams was not unusual in that building. My God. Lois Lee, a sociologist and director of the uh, California Association for Trollops, an organization that offered a hotline for sex workers at that time and acted as a go-between for them with uh, the police, spoke with the LA Times about Kimberly's murder. Lee said she got a call from a woman who ran an 
out-call prostitution service that fronts as a model agency. She said a man called around 8.45 p.m., said his wife had gone out of town for about two weeks for the first time in two years, and he wanted a young, attractive model. Lois Lee reported she said that he sounded like a real blah, just an ordinary square guy out for a good time. He was using a phone booth at the Hollywood branch of the Los Angeles City Library. The outcall operator noted that it sounded like the man was calling from a phone booth, but he said the noise was a TV set. At 9, the outcall operator called him back. She sent Kimberly Martin, a.k.a. Donna Wright, to an address, 1950 Cameron. One of Kimberly's acquaintances found a paper in her apartment with Cameron written on it and then crossed out, and then she wrote the street name Tamarind instead. Lois Lee believed the man gave the wrong street name to the operator and then gave Kimberly the correct street name so only she would have the right address. The service didn't receive a check-in call from Kimberly by 10 p.m., so the operator called Lois Lee to report a crime to the police. Lee called the LAPD Strangler Task Force. An officer said he was concerned but needed more information. She called again but did not speak to the same officer. By 10.30, Kimberly's acquaintances determined that the address was a vacant apartment. Her car was left nearby. Lois Lee now continued to call the police and was being, quote, shuttled by phone from one police desk and division to another. She was told to report the case to the West Hollywood station of the L.A. Sheriff's Office. Uh, Lois quoted one officer as saying, oh, she probably just changed trick houses and didn't tell you. You know how hookers are. You would think that the officer would be a little more concerned in light of all the recent murders. At 11.15 p.m., uh, she went to the West Hollywood station and was told that the task force was sending a patrol car to the apartment and to the sheriff's station to get a report from her. By 12.30 a.m., she was told there was a mix-up in the changing of patrolman shifts and no one had been ordered to do anything about the case. At 1.30 a.m., she finally talked to the officer she spoke to at 10 p.m. and he took her report. Lois was eventually informed Kimberly's body had been found and the police told her that her murder was now under investigation. According to Darcy O'Brien, Kenneth was the one who made the call. After giving a name and address, he said a girl named Donna called and said she would be there within 30 minutes. While Kenneth was speaking with the agency, Angela was harassing a woman at the library by following her around and just peeking through the bookshelves, making fucking creepy faces. They even approached her in the parking lot later and looked through her car windows at her. These two are fucking out of control, right? They just have to feel invincible at this point. They're just killing left and right. Police have no idea who's doing it. Just fucking with random women at the library for fun. Tossing whoever they want in their car, raping and killing them. Kenneth and Angelo parked in the basement garage of the apartment building where Donna would meet them. Kenneth got inside the vacant unit through a sliding glass door, lit some candles because the apartment had no power. Kimberly, a.k.a. Donna, soon entered the apartment. And a few moments later, Kenneth and Angelo showed their badges to her and insisted she come with them. They handcuffed her, started walking her out. She tried to escape, started screaming for help. Angelo now grabbed her, threw her into the apartment. She hit her head on the floor when she fell. Kenneth pushed a key into her back, told her it was a knife. Uh, They threatened to kill her if she made another sound. Kimberly's screaming seemed to have alerted some neighbors, so they waited until it was quiet again, then led her to the car. Kimberly apologized for screaming, asked them not to hurt her, telling them she had a little boy waiting for her at home. They didn't give a shit. Once they got her to Angela's house, they both raped her, strangled her, and then dumped her body on Alvarado Street near City Hall. After the start of the new year, the police now start to think the killing spree might finally be over. It had been a month since the Hillside Stranglers had killed anyone. But then after a holiday break on February 17th, 1978, the body of 20-year-old Cindy Lee Hudspeth, victim number 10, found in the trunk of her car 50 feet down an embankment off the Angeles Crest Highway north of La Canada. Helicopter spotted the car. Cindy had marks on her torso and neck and struggled with her killer. Deputy coroners determined that she died in a chokehold. Cindy's roommate had reported her missing on the morning of the 17th. Neighbor Joseph Betty, who lived directly below Cindy, said that at 4 p.m. on the 16th, she heard a woman uh, shout, what are you doing here? Cindy seemed excited and it sounded like she knew that person. Cindy was killed the day before her body was found. Uh, Bianchi came to Angelo's upholstery shop, saw uh, him speaking to Cindy, who allegedly said she was looking for a side job. Angelo told her that he had a list of job openings inside his house. While Kenneth talked to Cindy, Angelo grabbed the items they would use to kill her and then they attacked. They raped her for almost two full hours before Kenneth strangled her. This victim slightly different from the other. She had come to them. Cindy had driven to Angelo's home, so now they had to get rid of her car. They put her body into the trunk of her orange Datsun. Angelo followed Kenneth as he found an isolated spot near a cliff, and then together they pushed her car over the cliff. Cindy uh, was working as a clerk when she was killed. She was saving up money for college. She wanted to teach dance lessons to make extra money. She was last seen at her apartment at 800 East Garfield Avenue. 
She was likely heading to her night shift job answering phones at Glendale Community College when she was killed. She was kidnapped in the late afternoon between her apartment and the college. Cindy lived across the street from victim Christina Weckler. The two women did not know each other, but based on this information, the police now believed at least one of the killers lived in Glendale. Just a week after Cindy's murder, Kenneth's girlfriend, one of his girlfriends, Kelly Boyd, gives birth to their son, Ryan Bianchi. Uh, He's listed as Sean in one source, but Ryan in most sources. Uh, Now Kenneth, suddenly excited to be a dad. Excited enough to take a break from constantly raping and murdering girls and young women all around town. Uh, Not excited enough to really buckle down and help provide for his kid, though. Back in late 1977, Kenneth had started coughing and experiencing uh, difficulty breathing or more uh, uh, accurately, he started to fake having trouble breathing. He told Kelly he had lung cancer. <laughs> it's a fucking piece of shit and needed radiation and chemotherapy. You know, just total lies. Kelly was upset by the news, tried to be supportive of Kenneth. Kenneth started missing work because, you know, he claimed that the chemo was making him ill. No, he just wanted more time to, you know, fuck around with side pieces and try and kill people. One of the days when he was home because he was sick, detectives questioned him about the Hillside Strangler case because a murder may have occurred in the apartment building he uh, lived in. He was only questioned because of where he lived, not because he was considered a suspect on any level. Uh, Kenneth asked to participate in a ride-along now with LAPD, and I guess on that ride-along just fucking talked about the murders the whole time. He must have really gotten off on that shit. Meanwhile, Kelly and Kenneth are having problems in their relationship, right? She often uh, left to go stay with her brother, but she'd always come back. After their son is born, Kelly hoped that the baby would make Kenneth more financially responsible, but no. And she decides to move back to Bellingham, Washington to be close to her parents and her friends. Kenneth stays in Los Angeles for a little while. Uh, he's having trouble with his murder buddy now, with the buzzard. Angelo becomes furious when he learns Kenneth is questioned by police because of his close proximity to Christina Weckler and Cindy Hudspeth. And then he's questioned again when, as previously mentioned, his former girlfriend's mother called the police and voiced suspicions about Kenneth. Angelo has now stopped killing because he was real worried about getting caught. And he demands that Kenneth move to Washington. Get the fuck out of here. He straight up told him that if he didn't leave town, he would kill him. Right? The, the band experiencing some real infighting now. Some creative differences about their murder careers. Just, hey, the buzzer ain't interested in doing hard time for some soft trim, capiche? Hey! Fucking dark uh, fonts. Uh, Kenneth has been writing to Kelly constantly. She eventually does agree to give him another chance. And so he does move to Bellingham in May of 1978. They move in together. And that summer, Kenneth applies uh, to work for the Bellingham PD, does not get hired, but does manage to find some security guard work after a little stint working at Fred Myers, which is, uh, I think it's a chain just in the Northwest. I love Fred Myers, but it's, uh, it's kind of like Target. Sources do not say that he was a store detective, but let's assume that's exactly what he did. I still love the idea of the store detective. Uh, who's this serious? Uh, he was also training to become a Whatcom County Reserve Deputy and was working as a supervisor for a private security company in Bellingham by the end of the year. Uh, things were going well with Kelly, but he's not happy. He misses kidnapping, raping, and murdering. By 1979, he decides he just can't fight the urges he's feeling anymore. January 11th, Kenneth Bianchi lures 22-year-old Karen L. Mandick and 27-year-old Diane A. Wilder, both Western Washington University students, into a house under the ruse of offering them a house-sitting job at this dress. He worked with Karen at Fred Myers, and they had kept in touch. The house belonged to a family, the Catlows, whose company Kenneth worked for was installing a home security system. They were out of town for the week, and he had not finished setting up their system. When the two women showed up, Kenneth was waiting for them in his Whatcom security pickup. He asked Karen to accompany him inside the house, turn on some lights. When they go in together, he leads her to the basement under the guise of, uh, you know, showing her where the fuse box is. Once in the basement, with her back towards him, he grabs some rope he had hid for this exact purpose earlier and aggressively strangles her. He wanted to kill her as fast as possible. She was never even uh, able to make a cry. Uh, He pulled so hard, the rope cut through her flesh. When her body went limp, he goes back outside, tells Diane to come on in while Karen finishes familiarizing herself with the fuse box. And then he pushes her down the basement stairs, pouncing on her and strangles her quickly and brutally as well. Rather than have sex now with these women's corpses, he masturbates onto both of, both of them, then drags their bodies outside, tosses them into Karen's uh, Mercury hatchback. Then he drives the Mercury to a nearby cul-de-sac, uh, leaves it with the bodies heaped together inside, walks back through the rain to the Catlow's house, drives his pickup home, disposes of the rope he had used to strangle the woman along the way, and just crawls into bed with Kelly uh, and hopes that the news of the women's murders would make it all the way back to LA so that Angela would hear about it 
and know that the Kenneths didn't need the fucking buzzard to do what he had done. So weird fucking flex. And it would really backfire and quickly. The news would reach LA, just not in the way that Kenny hoped. This dumb shit was arrested the very next day. Uh, The Bellingham police learned that the women went missing on the morning of the 12th. Karen and Diane were both responsible people who wouldn't just run away without telling anyone. An acquaintance told authorities that Karen was hired by a man to watch a home off Willow Road from 7 to 9 p.m. on the 11th. She was supposed to be paid 100 bucks, seemed pretty excited about the money. Karen worked at a local Fred Meyer still. Uh, January 11th, she had never returned from her dinner break. Karen's boss remembered she had accepted a house-sitting job in a wealthy neighborhood from a security guard. The Bellingham police contacted the security firm that she had mentioned. The firm reached out to the security guard, Kenneth Bianchi, and asked him about the house-sitting job, which was supposedly for one of the security company's clients. Well, Kenneth said he didn't know anything about this job. Uh, He had never heard of Karen and Diane. He claimed he was at a sheriff's reserve meeting on the night they went missing. And the police find out that he's full of shit. He's lying. They reach out to him again. He says, uh, you know, he skipped the meeting because he he already knew about first aid, right? A topic, uh, you know, he's familiar with. At this point, the police have no evidence that foul play is involved in the disappearance, but they're suspicious, you know, but they think it's possible that, you know, Karen and Diane just went on a trip that weekend and forgot to tell anybody. But then the police find out that Karen had also told, told her boyfriend about the house setting job, mentioning Kenny's name directly. And in Karen's apartment, the police found a note in Diane's handwriting saying that Ken Bianchi had telephoned. The police also learned that he was using a company truck on the night the women disappeared, a truck he was supposed to take into the shop for repairs, but didn't. Chief Mangan, now very concerned for Karen and Diane's safety, well-being, asked Highway Patrol to check potential body dumping sites or look for abandoned cars. Finally, the police search the house where the girls were supposed to be. They find a fresh, wet footprint in the kitchen, but don't see the girls or their car. The police speak to a neighbor who was contacted by Bianchi and asked to check on the house every day, except the night the girls went missing. A little suspicious. On that night, he said there was work being done on the alarm system and didn't want her to be mistaken for an intruder. Chief Mangan asked the local media to now share the women's physical descriptions and a description of their cars. Within minutes, a woman calls to report a car abandoned in a wooden area near her home. When police check, Karen and Diane's bodies are found inside. Now, Chief Mangan orders Kenneth Bianchi to be picked up for questioning. Quick search of his place turns up uh, a bunch of obviously stolen goods. Shit, he had been taken from the places he was supposed to be protecting as a security guard. He's still running that fucking scam. So the police are able to book him for grand theft. Uh, They hold him first in the Bellingham City Jail and then at the Whatcom County Jail. The Bellingham police are able to kind of take their time now with forensic uh, work, you know, thanks to being able to hold Kenneth as long as they need on the grand theft charges. And they, uh, you know, are careful with evidence. For example, they use a sheet to catch stray fibers and hairs when they remove the bodies uh, from Karen's cars. They collect pubic hairs found on the steps of the house. Fibers from the carpets match fibers found on Karen and Diane's shoes and clothes. Kenneth Bianchi is now formally charged with second-degree possession of stolen property on January 15th, 1979, charged with possessing five phones, a bunch of tools, and a chainsaw. And his bail is set at $150,000. At that time, the bail for that charge would typically be $2,000 to $5,000, but Prosecutor Dave Macarin argued that Kenneth was the prime suspect in the two murders. Then while in custody, Kenneth is uh, quickly linked to the hillside stranglings in Los Angeles. Kenneth still had his California driver's license, And Chief Mangan had Bellingham law enforcement reach out to police in L.A., uh, the sheriff's office, and the Glendale Glendale PD. Sergeant Frank Salerno, we've heard his name, one of the Hillside investigators, answers one of these calls from Bellingham. Kenneth Bianchi's address matched the Tamarind Avenue address, located near two of the victims. Additionally, jewelry found in Kenneth's home matched the description of a necklace owned by Kimberly Martin and a ring owned by Yolanda Washington. Now Salerno heads to Washington to talk to Kenneth. Uh, Also, the LAPD released Kenneth Bianchi's photo to the media, and they almost immediately got a call from that lawyer, David Wood, the dude who helped Becky Spears escape from Angelo's Glendale home when he was trying to fucking pimp her out. Remember, Spears and Saber Hanan had been forced to perform sex work by both Angelo and Kenneth. Uh, So now Detective Paul Finnegan from the Glendale Sheriff's Office wants to speak with Angelo on the suspicion that he was involved in the murders. When questioned, of course, he denies knowing anything about the murders. You know, I'm sure he immediately wanted to kill Kenny. Hey, dipshit Ken, trying to get me sent to the pen. Couldn't convince him to keep his strangling hands off the trim. Hey! Uh, Back in Washington, Ken has convinced his lawyer, Dean Brett, that he was experiencing amnesia. How convenient. Brett was concerned that Kenneth would try to end his own life. Why be concerned about this guy? Uh, He had a psychiatric social worker now come and speak to his client. 
according to Marilyn Bardsley, who uh, she wrote uh, Bono and Bianchi, uh, or she wrote the uh, book Bono and Bianchi, The Hillside Stranglers. And in that book, she said the psychiatric social worker could not comprehend how such a mild mannered, considerate person could have strangled two women unless he was suffering from a multiple personality disorder. Kenny got the message and crafted a wonderful scam using his sprinkling of psychology from college and whatever he gleaned from seeing the movie classic, The Three Faces of Eve, years before. A multiple personality disorder, now commonly known as dissociative identity disorder, very popular quack disorder uh, as far as diagnosis, quack diagnosis in the late 70s. Uh, the 1976 two-part made-for-TV movie Sybil, a story about a woman with multiple personality disorder, re-aired right before Kenneth had an intake interview with Dr. John G. Watkins, who was an expert on both multiple personalities and amnesia. In March, Dr. Watkins would do a hypnosis session with Kenneth when he, uh, where he would reveal that the alternate personality, Steve Walker, was the one who murdered the girls in Los Angeles and strangled the victims in Bellingham. Uh, Kenny did not have an alternate personality, but was able to bullshit Watkins and some others into thinking he did. During a recorded session, Watkins told Kenneth, I have talked to a bit to Ken, but I think that perhaps there might be another part of Ken that I haven't talked to, and I would like to communicate with that other part. And Kenneth answered, call me Steve. I made him kill them. I hope he said it just like that, too. Call me Steve. I made him kill them. Uh, the doctor gave him an in to avoid taking responsibility for what he did, uh, maybe poss- possibly also avoid going to prison for the rest of his life, or the electric chair thanks to an insanity plea, and, you know, he fucking, of course, jumps all over it. Uh, Disassociative identity disorder, probably the most controversial current diagnosis in the psychiatric world. Back in the 80s, when uh, diagnosing this disorder peaked as far as popularity goes, some psychiatrists thought that as many as 20% of their patients had some form of this disorder. Now, most proponents uh, think that no more than 0.01 to 1% of the population has it. And a lot of psychiatrists think that literally no one has it because they think this disorder does not exist. Uh, Sergeant Salerno did not think Kenneth had this. Watching his interview with Dr. Watkins, he quickly noticed that Kenneth said he several times instead of I when referring to Steve. Dr. Dr., Dr. Watkins didn't even notice this. And Dr. Watkins really seems like a fucking quack. Uh, He was also really big into the now largely debunked validity of memories recovered during hypnosis sessions. Kenneth Bianchi, real Ken, not Steve, uh, implicates Angelo Buono, on March 21st, telling investigators that Angelo collaborated with Steve to commit the murders. Then he said that Steve killed two victims in Washington by himself. Totally. It was the fucking buzzard and his sidekick, Steve. Fucking Steve. Classic Steve. You know, poor Ken. No no one is more of a victim in all of this than Ken. Kenneth's lawyers uh, have him plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Bianchi's defense files papers with the court stating that the three doctors concluded Kenneth had a severe case of multiple personality disorder. And he was ordered to undergo further testing, right? They found three suckers. Uh, not just the case of multiple personalities, a severe case. The court has Dr. Ralph B. Allison, another expert on multiple personalities, speak to Kenneth. And this guy, not sure if he's still alive now. He'd be in his 90s now. Uh, this guy was not just a quack. He was fucking batshit crazy. Uh, I say that based on a website he still had going as of about a dozen years ago before he retired. Here's an excerpt from his author's page on Amazon to show where his mind was <laughs> in the late seventies says he met Marie, his most complicated multiple personality patient treating her from 1978 to 1981. He met her when she was 28 and followed her until she died two years ago at the age of 60. She is the subject of memories of an essence, how humans and spiritual beings put 70 personalities back together again. The part of her mind called the essence was named Becky. And she was Dr. Allison's primary source of information, being Marie's memory manager. This was the reason of calling the book Memories of an Essence. Becky also introduced Dr. Allison to her supervisors, Faith, Hope, and Charity, who defined themselves as angels, but they preferred to be called Celestial Intelligent Energy, or Psi. Their job descriptions are in the last chapter, where they describe how they monitor the whole human race. Okay. Uh, you know, going through a PhD program and getting a doctor title when you're young does not mean that you will, uh, you know, not be fucking cuckoo later in life. Dr. Allison also seemed to believe that Kenneth's statements, uh, or seemed to believe Kenneth's statements that the alternate personality Steve was the real killer. And, you know, of course he did. 
Uh, the prosecution had Dr. Martin T. Orn, an expert on hypnosis, determined if Kenneth was faking his multiple personality disorder. Dr. Orn has a method uh, or had a method to determine if a subject was pretending to be hypnotized or not. And Kenneth's responses to three out of the four tests he, uh, you know, put him through indicated that he was indeed faking his hypnosis. Dr. Orn told Kenneth that it was rare for someone with multiple personality disorder to have just two personalities. Usually there were three or more. And following Dr. Orn saying this, Kenneth magically uh, suddenly has another personality named Billy. And then two more unnamed personalities. So again, how convenient. And then another psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Fairstein, interviews Kenneth and also does not believe his claims of mental illness. Sergeant Salerno then learns that Thomas Stephen Walker was the name Kenneth signed on a letter to apply for the California State University diploma he used for that fake counseling business. Uh, additionally, Sergeant Salerno presented a photo lineup to witness Marcus Camden, DJ Bounty Hunter, Old Stray Eagle, uh, who picked Angelo out but did not recognize Kenneth. Uh, Marcus had checked himself into a hospital for depression, and the defense will later try and use this against his testimony. Luckily, a second witness, uh, Beulah Stouffer, uh, picked out Kenneth and Angelo from another lineup. The Los Angeles DA's office now offers Kenneth a deal. If he'll plead guilty to murders in Washington and some of the L.A. murders and drop his fucking bullshit insanity mumbo jumbo, he'll get life with the possibility of parole and can serve his sentence in California. If and only if he testifies against Angelo and Kenneth takes the deal. Kenneth now describes how he and Angelo pretended to be police officers using fake badges, how they convinced sex workers to get into cars, using them, uh, you know, or, you know, with them into cars with them. He's using that scheme. My God. Uh, Kenneth described the murders in detail in a casual tone, showing zero remorse. Salerno learned that they uh, picked certain sites because Angelo was familiar with the area because one of his girlfriends used to live there. I mean, based on how many girlfriends that fucking creep had, he's probably pretty familiar with the entire LA metro area. Kenneth Bianchi even told police about uh, some would-be victims who got away. He said he and Angelo planned to kidnap and murder 29-year-old Catherine Laurie, daughter of actor Peter Laurie. They stopped her as she was walking down the street in late October or early November, maybe, 1977, flashed their badges, asked for her ID. When she opened her wallet, they saw a picture of her dad, realized who she was. They planned to try and get her into their car, but decided not to when she said she was uh, going to an appointment just down the block. Actor Peter Lorre uh, had roles in Casablanca and the Maltese Falcon and died of a stroke in 1964. Uh, Lorre would say that she wasn't that scared during her encounter with the killers. She thought they were just casual and friendly guys. Uh, not quite. Kenneth appeared in court in Bellingham, Washington, October 19th, 1979. He received two life sentences for pleading guilty to the murders of Karen Mandick and Diane Wilder. Kenneth crowded crocodile tears during the proceeding and expressed remorse for the murders. I'm sure he did not actually have any. Uh, just a few days later, October 22nd, 1979, Kenneth Bianchi pleads guilty to five Los Angeles murders and receives six life sentences. He was sentenced for the murders of Yolanda Washington, Jane King, Christina Weckler, Kimberly Martin, and Cindy Hudspeth, and received another life sentence for conspiracy to commit murder, as well as a five-year sentence for one count of sodomy. Kenneth was calm and emotionless as he received his sentence. In Washington, Kenneth received consecutive sentences, but in California, the sentences would be concurrent. He would still technically be eligible for parole after seven years, but, you know, highly unlikely he would be considered for release. Officials estimated that he would serve 20 to 35 years in California, then a 26-year, eight-month minimum sentence in Washington. Angelo was arrested on October 22nd, 1979, charged with 10 counts of murder, uh, plus assault, rape, and other charges. Because Kenneth was only charged with five murders in L.A. as part of his plea deal, he was no longer facing the death penalty also felt he had uh, less incentive to cooperate, so now he starts to change his story, which decreases his credibility as a witness. Angelo, uh, his preliminary hearing begins May 7th, 1980. The public and the press are barred from the courtroom, and the judge issues a gag uh, order for attorneys and investigators. And now, despite both hillside stringers being imprisoned, they damn near claim another victim. In June of 1980, a very unstable and terrible woman named Veronica Compton wrote to Kenneth Bianchi, this is fucking ridiculous. This is part of the story. She initially wanted to interview him for a film script she was working on about a female serial killer, but then quickly falls in love with him, so much so that she is willing to kill for him. Kenneth and Veronica write to each other for a few months, and then she visits him. Uh, during the visit, Compton talked about how they should commit a murder together. So that's cool. Uh, Kenneth suggested that she travel to Washington, strangle somebody, and leave some of his DNA at the scene to help free him. Right? Prove that somehow... Someone else out there is leaving the same DNA evidence that he had left at the scenes of murders. How fucking evil. Help a known serial killer get released by killing another innocent woman. And then, of course, if Ken were to be released, he would just kill again and again until he was caught. 
Uh, Ken specifically suggested she plant semen at the crime scene. Excuse me. Veronica agreed. Kenneth was a uh, so-called non-secretor. So investigators could not get his blood type from his semen. Uh, with advances in DNA testing, now investigators would be able to get his blood type from his semen, but not back then. Kenny sent Veronica to Washington with a plastic glove full of his semen. How the fuck did he give her that? I have no idea. Seems like they were pretty relaxed when it came to a serial killer visitation. Uh, Veronica wearing a wig, pretending to be pregnant, meets 26-year-old Kim Breed at a bar in Bellingham, ends up luring her back to a motel room where she fucking attacks her, uh, gets a ligature around her throat, almost chokes her out, but then Kim fights back, escapes, and reports the attack to the police. Veronica flees to California. Then she sends a letter from California uh, and a tape to Bellingham telling the police that Kenneth is the wrong guy. The real killer is still out there because of the most recent attack. And now because of this fucking letter, the police link Veronica quickly to Kim Breed's uh, police report. According to Jennifer Furio's book, Letters from, Pr uh, Letters from Prison, Voices of Women Murderers, Veronica said that Kenneth Bianchi manipulated her while she was dealing with drug use and damage from sexual abuse as a child. Uh, you know, it's almost uh, never anyone's fault when they try to kill somebody or when they do kill somebody. Uh, Compton was found guilty of first-degree attempted murder, September of 1980. She's sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. She'll serve 23 years behind bars. Her story gets even weirder when she's in prison. In an interview years later, she said Kenny told her, I know you, you're just like me. People like us, we understand. We are like the wolves of society and everyone else, they're the lambs and we eat the lambs. Once behind bars, Veronica would correspond with other serial killers because Veronica is a fucking crazy dirtbag. She ended up corresponding regularly with serial killer Douglas Clark, who killed victims with his girlfriend, Carol Bundy. Uh, they ended up being called the Sunset Strip Killers. Clark would behead his victims after torturing them. Uh, I've actually thought about covering these killers several times. Might still do that. Uh, well, that fucker sent Veronica a Valentine picture of a female headless corpse. Veronica wrote a letter back to Clark that uh, read, I take out my straight razor and with one quick stroke, I slit the veins in the crook of your arm. Your blood spurts out and spills atop my swelled breasts. Then later that night, we cuddle in each other's arms before the fireplace and dress each other's wounds with kisses and loving caresses. Uh, so that's cool. That's fun stuff. Uh, Veronica also corresponded with James Wallace, a political science professor who occasionally taught at prisons. She wrote to him after listening to a lecture in 1987. They talked for the next two years, and in 1989, dipshit Wallace gets divorced after 38 years of marriage and marries Veronica in prison. What the fuck is so deeply wrong with so many people? In July of 1988, Veronica escapes from prison to see her son, whom she had not seen in several years. She's captured in Arizona after a week and a half, and now she asks Wallace to adopt her son. In 1993, she has a second child in prison, the result of a conjugal visit with Wallace. Uh, she's doing great. She's making so many solid choices. She's granted parole in 1996, moves in with Wallace and her daughter. Her son is an adult by this point. Uh, Veronica violates her parole, though, just after, after two weeks. A social worker visits the house to check on Veronica's daughter. And the social worker says that Veronica, this fucking genius, answers the door butt naked and has pornographic paintings on the walls behind her that are inappropriate for a child to see. So now she returns to prison until 2003. Seven more years for this fuck up. Uh, the year she gets out, she publishes her book, Eating the Ashes. Seeking Rehabilitation Within the U.S. Penal System. I hope almost no one has read it. Uh, her crazy ass has kept a low profile ever since. And I have a little bit more about her later that it'll come up with uh, some trial stuff that's even weirder than what I've already disclosed. Uh, now let's check in with Angelo. Just, hey, what's he up to? What's this guy? Hey, what's this, what's this fellow up to? Uh, the buzzard, his preliminary hearing, ends on March 16th, 1981. He's ordered to stand trial. It was looking like it was going to be difficult to prosecute Angelo because of a lack of physical evidence and concerns about Kenneth Bianchi's testimony, right? Would he be credible? November of 1980, Angelo, uh, his home was bulldozed after he signed over the deed to a glass shop. He's not an idiot. Uh, the shop remained standing, but investigators believe most of the murders took place in the house and a ton of critical evidence was now destroyed, right? Fucking crafty buzzard. When an LAPD criminalist matched a fiber found on Judy Miller's eyelid to material uh, from his upholstery shop, Prosecutors did have their first piece of physical evidence, though, against this piece of shit. Kenneth would now testify against Angelo for 28 days. He said uh, he and Angelo often flipped a coin to decide who would rape the victim first. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth testified that many of the murders and rapes were committed at Angelo's home. They handcuffed, blindfolded, gagged victims with materials from uh, Angelo's upholstery shop, uh, forced their victims to, quote, engage in sexual acts. 
Uh, I imagine those acts generally uh, things that no consenting human would ever agree to do. When describing the murder of Judy Miller, he said, there was a coin flip between Angelo and I. It was his idea. He won the toss, which meant he would go into the bedroom with Judy Miller at first. Ken testified the decision to kill Cindy Hudspeth, uh, Hudspeth was spur of the moment, right? She visited the upholstery shop in February of 1978 to ask about floor mats. When Kenneth showed up, they discussed killing her, then flipped a coin to see who would strangle her. Just fucking casually flipping coins in regards to people's lives. Just a little game, these guys. Uh, July 6, 1981, Kenneth Bianchi recants major portions of his testimony. Deputy DA Roger Kelly said, I would say the major portion of his value as a witness has been lost. You could say that this case is in trouble without any fear of contradiction whatsoever. Uh, Kelly acknowledged that dismissal of the charges against Angela were now a real possibility. Luckily, that will not happen. After eight months of a bunch more back and forth bullshit from Bianchi, Judge Roland M. George rules that the case for multiple murders against Bono can proceed. Jury selection starts November 23rd, 1981. Opening statements for the trial will begin March 1st, 1982. Luckily, witnesses far more credible than Bianchi will come forward. Uh, March 10th, 1982, 21-year-old Sabra Hannon testifies that she was abused by Angelo or yeah, Angelo Bono and fled Los Angeles to get away from him. She said she uh, went to Wisconsin because she was tired of getting beat up, tired of all the threats, tired of engaging in prostitution for Kenneth and Angelo. She told the prosecution that she was worried about Angelo finding her and avoided the police who were searching for her because she didn't think they were real officers because of Kenny and Angelo's fake badge bullshit. She testified she was in Angelo's home for three weeks, held captive in 1977. She had to ask permission to leave. Uh, her calls were monitored. She said Bianchi uh, beat her a few times with a wet towel to minimize bruises. She refused to come back to California until she knew Kenneth had been arrested and her lawyer told her that Angelo was being watched by the police. Sabre was allowed to testify about a, quote, perverted sex act that she was forced to perform where she was gagged by Angelo's dick to the point of passing out, similar to being choked. At trial, the prosecution also presented the girl that Angelo harassed at the Hollywood Library the night of Kimberly Martin's murder. On June 29th, 1982, Kenneth Bianchi said in court that he felt obligated to testify against Angelo even without the deal. I would still come forward. These are things I've experienced and witnessed. When asked if these experiences were related to the murders, he answered yes and other things. On the 28th, Kenneth said he uh, made up for his, or sorry, on the 28th, Kenneth said he made up his multiple personalities bullshit because of urgings from his old lawyer and social worker who wanted to try and establish an insanity defense. And he came to accept these things as true. Uh, I was told if a true multiple personality emerged, it would solidify the defense of not guilty by reason of insanity. When I was asked to produce these personalities, I gave them names. They were just names floating around in my head. The jury started to deliberate now on October 21st, 1983. The prosecution luckily had some hard evidence, right? Uh, that whole fiber situation from Judy Miller's eyelid, uh, proven to have come from Angelo's uh, home and shop. Uh, there were animal hairs found on Lauren's hands that were uh, from Angelo's pet rabbits. And there was an imprint of a police badge on Angelo's wallet with puncture marks from where the badge was pinned, which lines up with a bunch of testimony. Other evidence included the testimony of Catherine Laurie, the testimony of witness uh, fucking DJ Marcus Camden, bounty hunter, uh, who is the only eyewitness linking Angelo to a victim, and the testimony of witness Jan Sims, who said she witnessed Kenneth and Angelo attempt, attempting to abduct a woman. But then defense attorney Catherine Mater and had Veronica Compton testify about a conspiracy between herself and Kenneth to frame Angelo. <laughs> this is so fucking ridiculous. Veronica again prosecuted Michael Nash, questioned Veronica, and asked about her plans to open a mortuary with Douglas Clark right, the Sunset Strip Killer, so that the two of them could fuck dead bodies. And Veronica did not deny that. She said she, <laughs> she said she was, quote, seriously considering it. Like I said, Veronica is a fucking dirtbag, just as messed up as the Hillside Stranglers. Okay, October 31st, 1983. Now, Angela, Angelo Bono convicted of the first degree murder of Lauren Wagner. Three days later, acquitted of the murder of Yolanda Washington. Two days after that, guilty of the murder of Judith Miller. Jury now declares a special circumstance for multiple murders, which made Angelo eligible for the death penalty. November 8th, uh, Angelo found guilty of the murders of Dolly Cepeda, Sonia Johnson, and Kimberly Martin. On November 10th, found guilty of the murders of Alyssa Caston, Jane King, Christina Weckler. And finally, November 14th, found guilty of the murder of Cindy Lee Hudspeth. Earlier that day, Angelo requested to represent himself during the penalty phase, citing differences with his attorneys. And the judge was like, man, shut the fuck up. Uh, no, but his, his judge, uh, the judge did request his request. 
or reject it. Sorry. I would love it. If a judge just snapped like, man, shut the fuck up. You piece of shit. Uh, November 16th, 1981, Angela told the court, my moral and, un- and constitutional right has been broken and I ain't taken any procedure in this trial. I stand mute. I'm sorry. What was that buzzard? Uh, again, it kind of reminds me of the Fonz. Just, hey, my moral and constitutional right has been broken, Your Honor. I ain't taking any procedure in this trial. I won't do it. I stand mute. I'm out of here. Hey. Uh, he also refused to speak to his attorneys. Angelo's sister, Cecilia Burke, spoke at his sentencing hearing, and she said, I believe down in my heart, he didn't do anything. He even had trouble killing animals when we had to eat them. A little too late to make anyone believe he wasn't violent. Might not have been violent as a kid, but super fucking violent since then. On November 18th, 1983, the jury sentences Angelo to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Judge George not pleased with the jury's decision to spare Angelo's life. St. Angelo Bono and Kenneth Bianchi subjected various of their murder victims to the administration of lethal gas, electrocution, strangulation by rope, and lethal hypodermic injection. Yet the two defendants are destined to spend their lives in prison, housed, fed, and clothed at taxpayer expense, better cared for than some of the destitute law-abiding members of our community. Yeah, fucking hell, Nimrod, I like it. Fuck it, I Cut these guys' fucking heads off. Uh, Angelo was sent to Folsom Prison and refused to come out of his cell once he got there because he was afraid of the other inmates. The Italian Stallion! Not so tough when he's not teaming up with another dude to take on smaller young women or girls. Uh, He was eventually transferred to Calipiatra State Prison. Uh, Bianchi returned to Washington. He hadn't cooperated as a witness as much as he was supposed to be, and that fucked up part of his plea bargain. September 17th, 1985, Bianchi actually tells the California Board of Prison Terms that he should never be released from prison. He says the crimes are horrendous. I can I can't understand how anybody could commit these types of crimes. I love how he said just like anybody. Excuse me, like it like it just wasn't him. No, it was, it was fucking Steve. This is personality Steve. Kenneth was sentenced under an indeterminate sentencing law that stated that anyone convicted of first degree murder with the possibility of parole was eligible for parole after just seven years. That law would eventually be changed so that anyone convicted of first degree murder had to serve at least 12 years and six months in prison. Kenneth made his statements by phone from Washington where he was uh, still imprisoned. Kenneth also told the board that anyone could become a killer. He said, soldiers do it. Police officers. <laughs> I love how he's fucking comparing what he did. You know, soldiers uh, kill people to defend, you know, uh, their countries in, in war, defend their homelands. Uh, police officers do it. Yeah, they don't fucking r- r- strangle and rape fucking people. I mean, you know, the overwhelming majority of them don't. Uh, I think anybody is capable, he says, they don't necessarily have to have some sort of serious disorder to do so. He also described his good qualities, saying, I am loving. I'm sensitive, you know? I do get into situations that are sad and I do cry. I am caring and I am loving. <laughs> That's when I wish the best. Man, shut the fuck up! And just hang up the phone on him. Uh, he also talked about some Christian counseling he'd been receiving in his mental state. Said, I feel like some textbook uh, of psychological disorders. I've been labeled with everything under the sun. <laughs> and I'm just one person. I'm not saying nothing is wrong with me, sir. I'm not saying that at all. I don't believe I am perfectly well. But what is well? I'm not a psychologist. He's a good guy, everybody. He's, he's just like you, you know, anybody listening right now, he's, you're the same as Kenneth Bianchi. You're exactly, you, you guys, I can't fucking tell you apart. You could have done exactly what he did. Uh, March 23rd, 1987, a prison official confirms that Angelo Bono marries 35 year old Christine Kazuka, mother of three and supervisor at the Los Angeles office of the state employment development department. Uh, wow. I guess that department will just hire any fucking idiot. Angelo had met Christine's husband when they spent five months next to each other in jail. Her husband was serving time for assault with a deadly weapon. She really knows how to fucking pick him. Uh, Kazuka divorced her husband in 1983 and then continues to visit Angelo in prison. Angelo would uh, never receive conjugal visits with Christine, thankfully, due to the nature of his crimes against women. Uh, September 22nd, 1989, Washington prison officials announced that Kenneth marries 26-year-old Shirley Joyce Book, a pen pal from Louisiana. This is Kenneth's first marriage. Why, Shirley? The two start to write each other or started to write each other in 1986, uh, spoke over the phone and then met for the first time the day of their wedding. How, how sweet. Uh, 67 year old Angelo dies of natural causes in his cell at Calipiatra State Prison, September 21st, 2002. That sucks. He suffered from heart problems, no signs of trauma when he was alone uh, in his cell and he was alone in his cell when he died and he died peacefully, which is such a bummer. Bob Martinez, spokesman for California Department of Corrections, told the New York Times in 2002, He had assigned duties at the prison and he was single celled because of the nature of his crime. There was nothing exceptional about his conduct in prison. 
And then Kenneth Bianchi, uh, he is currently incarcerated at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. Uh, he is 71 years old. He is one of several serial killers held there as I record this. Gary, the Green River Killer, Ridgeway, Spokane serial killer, Robert Lee Yates, Jack Owen Spillman, a.k.a. the Werewolf Butcher, and a bunch of other murderers and rapists all in that same facility. What a what a wild place to work. Kenneth will next be eligible to apply for parole in 2025. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Angelo Bono and Kenneth Bianchi. Right, I told you up top. I told you they were good guys. And now we understand that. Uh, no, two terrible cousins who became the Hillside Stranglers. Angelo, f- fucking buzzard, showed early signs of being a woman-hating monster. Right, As a teen, he shared rape fantasies with his friends, hated how casual with sex his mom was, called her things like whore and cunt as a teenager. He was a deadbeat dad by the t- time he was 21, raping his second wife by the time he was 22. By his late 30s, he's raping his stepdaughter. By his early 40s, literally jerking off while standing in the window, looking at high school girls across the street with a fucking pair of binoculars in his hand. Legendarily creepy. He was fucking his son's girlfriends. He was encouraging his sons to sleep with their stepsister. He was also fucking and even impregnating all kinds of teen girls. And soon when he and Kenny got together, he was trying to pimp some of those teens out. I still think he probably uh, raped a whole bunch of girls and women before he ever killed his part of the Hillside Stranglers duo. Uh, Kenny did not seem to have any early warning signs of being such a predator, right? He loved his adoptive mother, but she smothered him. All right. Well, how many other people have had smothering moms? Millions and millions and millions. Uh, when he was 19, uh, excuse me, he smashed a girlfriend's window in when she, uh, wouldn't let him in her apartment. He was super controlling, possessive, insecure, jealous. He also fucked around a lot on whoever he was dating, but didn't seem to be raping. Didn't seem to be directly physically abusive to women. Uh, he did steal shit while on the job as a security guard, but not, you know, violent. But then when he was 24, he moved to Glendale, roomed up with the fucking Emperor Palpatine with the buzzer for six months. And the buzzard seems to have brought out the worst in him, to put it mildly, right? Taught him the wickedest of ways. Had he not moved out to Glendale, I'm not sure he would have ever become a killer. I don't think he would have. Angelo, probably. Uh, you know, but then when these two guys split up, it's Ken who kills again, but not Angelo. Or did Angelo keep killing but just not get caught for more murders? We'll never know. Neither one of these fuckers were ever executed for their crimes. Unfortunately, both men actually went on to get married in prison. After all that they'd done, 10 murders they both participated in and an extra two Kenneth committed alone. Some women still thought, yeah, that guy. I like that guy. The fucking convicted murderer with a gargoyle face. That's the guy I want to spend the rest of my life with. But not really since our visits will forever be supervised. Uh, While the buzzer died in prison in 2002, Kenneth technically could still get out of prison. Again, eligible for parole next in 2025. If by some miracle he gets out, which he won't. But if he does, I truly hope somebody strangles him. Right? Someone who then gets away with it. Fuck that guy. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Angelo Bono, Kenneth Bianchi were the Hillside Stranglers, two American serial killers and cousins who terrorized the Los Angeles metro area from October of 1977 through February of 1978, raping and killing 10 women and girls between the ages of 12 and 28 before Ken goes on to to kill two more women in Bellingham, Washington. Number two, Angelo Bono called himself the Italian Stallion. Seems at least a few other people called him the buzzard. The fucking buzzard, Fonzie, fuckhead, stallion, love the ladies, uh, or he loved to use the ladies for sexual desires, at least. Angelo Bono had several relationships that led him to father eight kids. He had God knows how many girlfriends, many of whom were underage girls that he groomed and sexually abused and raped. Number three, shortly after he was arrested for two additional murders in Washington State, uh, Kenneth Bianchi claimed that he suffered from multiple personality disorder, now called disassociative identity disorder. He didn't kill any women and girls. It was his alternate personality, Steve Walker. Fucking Steve. Several experts disagreed on whether or not he was telling the truth. Ultimately, Ken admitted he was lying. He was just manipulating some pretty shitty psychiatrists in order to get an insanity defense. Number four, Veronica Compton is a weird dirtbag I did not expect to meet in this episode. She tried to kill 26-year-old Kim Breed in Bellingham and then plant Kenneth's semen on her in a very misguided attempt to free Kenneth. After getting caught and going to prison, she soon became pen pals with another serial killer, Douglas Clark, 
one of the Sunset Strip killers, and they fantasized about opening a mortuary together so they could fuck dead people. And she is currently free and out there in the world somewhere. So that's super cool. That's that's fun. Douglas is 75 and thankfully still stuck inside San Quentin. And number five, new info on January 19th, 2007. 20-year-old Christopher Bono, the grandson of Angelo the Buzzard Bono, shot his grandmother, 67-year-old Mary Castillo, Candy Castillo, Angelo's former wife, and then took his own life. This poor woman, she was raped by Angelo, a man who impregnated her four times, a man who threatened to kill her on multiple occasions, finally escapes him in 1964. And then her and Angelo's grandson shoots her 43 years later. The shooting took place in the storage space of Yorba Linda Patio and Hearth, a business owned in Yorba Linda, California uh, by Christopher's father. Mary luckily survived the attack. Christopher had lived with Mary in Fullerton for about a year. Uh, she lived with a few of her kids and grandkids. Neighbors described her as a helpful and chatty person. Mary's neighbor, uh, Shirley Wentworth, told the Orange County Register she had nothing to do with what Angelo Bono did. She concentrated on raising children. People should leave her alone or care about her because she's married, not because she used to be married to that man. Well, Mary lived another dozen years after being shot, passing away in 2019 at the age of 80. It does not appear that she was ever the victim of violence again. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The hillside stranglers have been sucked. Eee. Man, uh, creepy, creepy fucking team of dudes. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for the help in making Time Suck this week again. Thanks to uh, Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, for the help and for setting up some some birthday stuff along with Tyler here. Uh, it is uh, my birthday as I record this. Be quite a ways after it by the time you hear it. Uh, thanks again to the Suck Ranger, Tyler C., for uh, producing and directing today. Thanks to Bit Elixir for upkeep on the Time Suck app. The Art Warlock, Logan Keith, creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com. And helping run our socials with the Suck Ranger and a team led by social media strategist Ryan Handelsman. Thanks to producer Olivia Lee for some deep digging, combing through a lot of newspaper databases for the research this week. And thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad for making sure Discord keeps running smooth. Everyone over on the Time Sucks subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. Thanks to all the uh, the listeners too who teamed together to do some cool b- birthday stuff for me that we put out there on socials. And just thanks to all of you for taking a uh, uh, listen to this podcast and, can you know, continuing to. Next week on Time Suck, we get a weird one. The Space Scissors have chosen the death of Brian Wells and the Pizza Bomber heist. We've been thinking about this one for a couple of years. Uh, Wells was a 46-year-old man living in Erie, Pennsylvania. He worked as a delivery driver for a local restaurant called Mamma Mia's Pizzeria. He rented a small house. He had three cats, took his mom out to the movies, uh, was considered an overall friendly, nice guy. I uh, never really seemed to value money or material things, and that is why it was so shocking to those who knew him when they found out he walked into a bank August 28, 2003, with a bomb locked around his neck, a modified cane gun in his hand, and he demanded $250,000 in cash. Brian was arrested minutes later. He told police that he had been accosted by a group of men who locked the collar bomb around his neck and forced him to rob that bank. He was supposed to find keys that would unlock the collar bomb before it detonated, but he was running out of time. Uh, Brian was telling the truth. He did run out of time and sadly died when that bomb fucking blew up around his neck. Investigators were left with a mystery that would take several years to unravel. The plot subsequently uncovered has been described as one of the most complicated and bizarre crimes in the history of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Next week, we will meet the alleged and known conspirators, discuss how and why they were involved in the bank heist. We'll discuss a strange frozen body case, romance has gone wrong, alliances, betrayals, and more. Right now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. Our first update coming in from a smart and alarmed sack, Emily Arvalo. Arvalo. Who writes, uh, hey, Dan, great show in Madison, Wisconsin this week uh, was the second show my husband and I got to see in person. And as always, we loved it. As a parent to a small child, your bit about banned books was super funny. Our son loves penguins. And we recently found out that one of his favorite books has been banned in a bunch of places. The book and Tango Makes Three follows the true story of two dad penguins at the Central Park Zoo that are given an egg to hatch after the zookeeper realized they have paired together for mating. Artwork is great. The authors are LGBTQ. Uh, Totally mind-boggling to me 
that the book would be banned as at the end of the day, it's a really heartwarming story. Anyways, thanks again for touring to Wisconsin. Look forward to future shows, Emily. Well, thank you, Emily. And thank you for mentioning the whole wave of fucking book bans. The propaganda out there that books are being banned only for being like highly sexual, far too graphic for children to uh, be reading is total bullshit. It is a false narrative perpetuated by hate mongers. Books like Antango Makes Three are being banned, uh, you know, as is celebrated literature by heralded authors like Toni Morrison and John Steinbeck. Steinbeck. Uh, there are just far too many activist groups out there taking a very extreme Christian fundamentalist worldview and successfully getting books taken out of non-Christian public schools and community libraries. Books, you know, not promoting heterosexual Judeo-Christian values are the ones being targeted regardless of sexual content or not. It, it is extremely uh, ignorant, intolerant, and just flat out wrong. And I look forward to continuing to mock that kind of backwards bullshit with more stand up. I've just fucking truly had it with the rising tide of anti uh, anti intellectualism in America. Right? I'm just sick of the loudest voices pushing their beliefs over the interests of what I believe to be a larger but silent majority. And I just, I'm going to be less silent as part of that majority uh, going forward. So fuck that shit. Uh, next up, former cult member Meat Sack, uh, Jessa. Jessa Boot, Jessa Boutet, I think I must say Boot, uh, has a topic suggestion. Writing, hi, Sock Master, I grew up in the Moonies, basically the quintessential cult of the 20th century. I'm always surprised that Time Suck has not sucked it yet. Please do. I would love to see what you find online and then assess how close it is to the lived experience. Thank you, Jessa. Well, Jessa, thank you for the email. Uh, yes, we're going to cover that topic later this year, in part because of your email. And anyone can send a topic suggestion to Bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com. You don't have to be a space lizard. Uh, just send it in. You never know which topic we might jump on. Next up, super sucker Sarah Irving has a shout out request. Uh, Sarah writes, good evening, dear leader of the Suck Dungeon. Long time listener, first time writer. I'm writing because I just got back from two long ass road trips from Knob Nostra, Missouri. <laughs> LOL, yes, our town's name is Knob Nostra. That's a fucking weird name. Uh, to Edmond, Oklahoma and back. Yes, I did it all in one day, twice. Last week, I had to take my horses to get some surgery and then pick, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I added the S there. I had to take my horse, singular, to get surgery and then pick him back up from the surgeon. And yes, I have a Russia's Strongest Pony Boy sticker on my horse trailer. I spent my time catching up on the latest Time Suck podcast. I take fairly frequent road trips because of my horses and love using Time Suck as a method of measuring how much time I have left in my drive. Oh, I have four hours left. Means I can probably get through two more Time Sucks before I get there. Kind of like how horse uh, horse people measure height in hands. Four inches is one hand. I measure drives and time sucks. Two and a half hours is roughly a time suck. Anyway, I wanted to write in and thank you for the quality content you put out every week. My husband, Andrew, is actually the one who got me listening to time suck. He's been a loyal space lizard for years now. Quite often when we're on road trips together, we'll put on the latest episode and listen. But right now he's deployed and country redacted. So we are not taking road trips together. Time suck is one of those nice little tastes of home that he has with him over there. And it's something we can share despite the distance. Our fifth wedding anniversary is coming up on the 26th of May. I was hoping you could give Andrew a shout out. Mail to APOs is so insanely slow and unpredictable. I don't think I could get anything to him in time. But I know he would love a shout out from the Grandmaster Suckmaster himself. Andrew is awesome. He is a great dude. He is super compassionate and supportive. Pretty easy on the eyes too. We've been through a lot since we got married and there's nobody I would rather have in my corner than Andrew. Anyway, now that we're done with the mushy stuff, I apologize for the brevity of my email. Hail to Safina. Good boy, Bojangles. Three out of five stars. Wouldn't change a thing. Your loyal subject and horse enthusiast, but not pony play enthusiast, Sarah. Well, Sarah, thank you for the message. And, and sorry this will not be heard in time, recording too far in advance now, but close and better late than never, right? Uh, Andrew, I hope you get back home soon because your sexy sarsaparilla misses you. I'm picking up on road hard, put away wet vibes. Wink, wink. Hey. Uh, I, I should have added the A there. That was just in my head there. I'm not trying to link fucking Angela Bona to this. Probably didn't need the wink either. I just, I just love how much Sarah loves you, man. Very special. Cherish it. Happy belated wedding anniversary. Uh, now send her a dick pic. She might not say she wants it, but maybe she's forgotten, you know, what it looks like. And she wants to stare at it longingly on her nightstand as she falls asleep. I've never heard of a single woman ever wanting to do that ever, but who knows? It could happen. Uh, Sarah, I hope that all of this was, uh, was not too much. You've been here a while now, so I'm going to, I'm going to guess it wasn't. Hope this gives you at, at the very least, uh, something to both laugh about together. 
And now one more from a cult adjacent listener who wishes to remain anonymous. I'm always interested in Scientology stuff. And they write, Dear Time Suck, I'm new to Time Suck and I'm still in 2020 episodes, listing in chronological order because I have OCD like that. This is a bit dated, but I thought you would find it interesting. My mom worked directly for L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> that is, yes, I fucking, I do find that interesting. Uh, she was one of the CMOs, Commodore's Messenger Organization members. It gets weirder. My aunt and her family are still in Scientology and she was slash is a very high up person in the church. My grandma sued Scientology and won. My mom did get out. She escaped after uh, being in from like age 14 to 18. She never liked to talk about her time in Scientology for obvious reasons. She was a good mom for our childhoods, although fell apart later in life. Uh, I uh, grew up with my mom and grandma as most of my family. I was able to meet my aunt when I was 18 or she was able to meet me and met my cousin when I was 14. She literally grew up her entire life in Scientology. And as you can guess, is pretty fucking weird. She was, quote, homeschooled, but basically didn't go to school and was illiterate and learning to read as a teenager. My aunt never talked to my grandma again, but did come to her funeral when she tried to take over all logistics of our family, even though she hadn't been around for 20 plus years. I've seen my mom around these Scientology weirdos when family members die and my aunt and uncle try to like reprogram my mom and use all these Scientology words to suck her back in. Pretty fucking weird. Unfortunately, as my mom became an empty nester, her mental health and addiction really ran rampant. She's bipolar, but doesn't believe she is and is in total denial. When she goes manic, she thinks Scientologists are after her and starts writing a manifesto to expose them, although we know they've already been exposed. The worst part is that they do follow and harass people. Uh, so her delusions are somewhat believable, but there is no evidence this has happened to her. It's all in her head. I think even though she's not in Scientology, hasn't been for 40 years, the brainwashing about avoiding psychology is still embedded in her mind and is part of the reason she won't get help. One more crazy thing. Late December, I flew my mom out because I'm her last family willing to deal with her and had a, and, uh, had a deal with her that if I helped her, she would seek help for her alcoholism and mental health. I worked with a local health advocacy group, got in-stay rehab lined up for her, and then a few days before it was time for her to go, I did a little checking on their website just to see what kind of activities and programs they were using. And I discovered that this rehab called Narcon, it's like Narconon, that yeah, Narconon is a fucking front for Scientology. I almost sent my mom off to relive her experience being trapped in a Scientology compound, I shit you not. She had been with her Scientology sister before she came out to be with me. So I was like, does Scientology somehow engineer this? Is the local health organization I'm working with a fucking wing of Scientology too? Then I got paranoid and a bit crazy. Turns out it was just a really strange coincidence, but Jesus, that's fucking crazy. Another crazy story about how Scientology tore apart a family and fucked up a bright, beautiful young woman's life. Having your family ship you off to a cult when you're 14 will do that to you. Since Scientologists do harass people, I trust you won't use specific names if you share this info, right? Yes, did not share the names. Uh, man, anonymous sucker, what a tragedy. Yeah, Scientology is fucking terrible. Uh, the way they harass people, critics and former members, uh, truly indefensible. Bunch of brainwashing bullshit made up by a half-ass Pulp Fiction author. And almost 40 years after their founder's death, they're valued at a few billion dollars thanks to all the real estate they've been able to buy by grifting members and not paying taxes, which I think is so fucked up thanks to some bullshit religious organization loophole. Cult, cult, cults, man. They are not going away anytime soon. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Scared to death and time suck each week and the secret suck for space lizards. Please do not move in with a creepy cousin this week and decide to rape and kill teens when you can't figure out how to make enough money to pay your bills as a pimp. Just, uh, you know what? Just don't be a piece of shit this week, please. Just keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. I'm very curious if my Fonzie comparison to running gag is, is going to land. I, pr I probably should have went with the store detective running gag. That would have been better. Right? It's just not easy to sell a reference to a TV show that stopped airing new episodes in 1984. <laughs> hey, what kind of wise guy thinks a sitcom character who peaked in popularity when these bozos were killing could still get laughed today? Even Henry Winkler doesn't do the fonts no more. Maybe I should have combined the two. <laughs> just had a weird fucking store detective who also is kind of like Fonzie. Hey, Detective Fonzie here. 
They got me stationed at Hot Topic. I mostly try to make sure that the uh, most popular t-shirts aren't taken by the teens. But sometimes I do have to worry about killer. Deals from Zoomies across the mall, which are our main competition. Sometimes I track people to Orange Julius and Hot Dog on a Stick. Make sure they're not murdering their stomachs with uh, heavily preserved uh, terrible food choices. They don't listen to me. Hey! I'm just a washed up sitcom character slash store detective. I probably should have made notes for this ending. <laughs> I'm just kind of winging it. Just kind of trusting the saxophone. Guide me into some more deep sounding but really nonsensical things to say. Everything sounds cooler when you put a little smooth jazz behind it. Take care of yourselves out there, meat sex. And don't shoplift, because I'll be watching. Hey.